15th meeting of the Preston County Board of Commissioners to order at this time and um, call to order and also recognizing that we do have a quorum. And um, first I will ask Commissioner Sims to lead us in an invocation and um, then Commissioner Perrier to lead us in our Pledge of Allegiance. Please, if you will, uh, bow your heads, we pray. Dear Holy Father, we just thank you for allowing us to be here today, and we ask that you would lead us and guide us as we go forth in county business today. Lift up those who may be suffering and going through difficult times. Uh, at this time, we just pray that you will comfort them. We pray for our law enforcement, pray for our soldiers, pray for those who are doing their, their due diligence to uh, keep us safe uh, in this country. Lord, we just ask that you would open our minds, let us have a good meeting, and uh, lead us and guide us as we go forth. These things we pray in the most heavenly name. Amen. 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 Would you please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next on the agenda is discussion and adjustment for approval of the agenda as presented. We have a motion. Move for approval. I have a motion to approve. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. At this time in our meeting, we have informal uh, comments, a period set aside for that purpose. And uh, uh, Madam Clerk, you will tell us how many speakers. We have seven individuals signed up to speak. Okay, so we need to we need to have about a let's just go with two minutes per speaker. Um, if IT would keep time for us there with the seven. We'll begin with Miss Catherine Fulkerson of Robert Gentry Road, Timberlake. Yes, if you'll touch the podium, speaking to the mic. Hello, I'm, I am uh, Dr. Catherine Fulkerson, and I have been living in Person County for the last 16 years. Uh, I uh, just recently got appointed to the Board of Adjustment, and I'm very proud of that. Um, and I am using this opportunity to get in, more involved in the government of my county. Uh, I live on the Flat River, the North Flat River, and that is one of my concerns um, about how that's going to be developed. I, I spend two or three hours every day um, maintaining my river frontage and uh, grow hay on the pasture in my, on my farm, and that feeds the cattle that are and on the adjoining farms. Uh, so I'm very actively involved in that rural community. And I want to make sure that the developments that are planned in regarding um, the Flat River Park are taking into account the citizenry. I'd also like to speak to the issue of in more involvement from the citizens. Um, I had a hard time finding out about, you know, what was going on. And it would be very good if there were more widespread education uh, about what's going on and the, the plans that are being made by you folks. And I know you work hard to do that, uh, but it, it's really hard for us out in the community to know what to come to and what not to come to. And I learned from my many years in working on boards and commissions in Durham County that the citizenry really educated me uh, about what their needs were in the county and in the city. And I, so I see the importance of that. And I'm, I'm not speaking against anything more in favor of in, increasing citizenry involvement. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll have Mr. Barry Allen of Morris Mule Road, Ridgemont. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my wife and I live on uh, Morris Mill Road in Southern Person County on the Flat River. It is likely that you will approve the Joint Comprehensive Land Use Plan this morning. 
However, I would like to go on the record with one very specific but very serious reservation. On page 90, this plan explicitly incorporates the priorities of another document, the 2014 Parks and Recreation Master Plan. That plan has as two of its highest priorities to develop a greenways master plan to start to acquire land to, equate, to create a greenway trail system. Where would these greenways be located? The master plan does not tell us, but a series of other person county planning documents may give us clues. In 1997, there's this. Within the river buffer area, public projects such as greenways may be allowed. In 2001, this objective is stated to identify rivers, major creeks, streams, and drainage ways as opportunities for development of an extensive greenway system. In 2012, this is written, the Flat River is a significant riparian corridor that includes multiple tributaries. Eventually, these corridors are opportunities for public passive recreation. In 2015, another document refers to the Flat River as a linear park. In 2019, a document concluded Workers and businesses desire proximity to greenways. Fast forward, forward to this year. At your regular commission meeting on May 17th, you approved a proposal for a public park on 281 acres of county-owned property on the Flat River in Person County. <clears throat> what would any reasonable person think of after discovering these successive policy documents? It could only be that for a long time, the per, our Person County government has been quietly making plans for our for Flat River properties without our knowledge. It could be. Okay, okay I wrote a three minute speech, but anyway, my closing lines is, uh, now we need to work together uh, to figure out what to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Mr. Chris Weaver of Satterfield Farm Road, Timberlake. That's unfortunate. That's very unfortunate. We have all these people here, and we're cut down to this. Two minutes. I'm sorry, sir. You were, you were making some very good observations. <laughs> Quietly planning all this time. Kind of what I was thinking about the mega site. You know, it's ignored all this time, quietly planning. What's quietly planning going on down at the South Side Air Park? What's going on down there? That stuff's gonna build out. I don't have a problem with that, but I don't like it at the expense of losing opportunities at our mega site. We've lost opportunity after opportunity. You've known Volvo Electric Truck Batteries, Siemens Corporation. These all could have been providing jobs right now in the form of construction out there, but they're not. I just had a call over the weekend from two people going to school elsewhere, and they don't think they're ever coming back because there are not going to be jobs here for them. And that's unfortunate. They both asked me, how do they vote in county elections? I told them because they right now they've only been voting in presidential elections. I don't know what the problem is, this secret agenda to ignore this fantastic opportunity. I don't know why the EDC director gets a $24,000 raise and has nothing to show for it, nothing. Not even a degree in economic development, okay? We need somebody who can lead this county forward in that department. I don't, this structure has to go away. I know you love the structure as it is for the EDC right now because you got control of it. We need to break it up and we need to make it work for everybody in this community. Jobs cuts across the political boundary, okay? We need jobs for everybody and we need to stop missing opportunities. No more maps with latitude and longitude. Here, I hope you find it. That's out of control. Next, we have Mr. Jimmy Clayton of Berman Clayton Road, Timberlake. Good morning. 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 morning, Jimmy Clayton, 717 Berman Clayton Road in Timberlake. I ran for commission in 2000 because of the flat river. All of my neighbors showed up like they did today, worried about what you might do down the banks of the flat river. I'm still concerned about it. I think you need to take this greenway plan out of your comprehensive planning ordinance 
and set it over on the side for right now. I don't know what you need to do with it later, but I want you to understand that I pay property tax all the way to the center of the Flat River. My neighbor across the Flat River, he pays to the center. So it's not like the, and I understand the Flat River belongs to the people of North Carolina, the water in it. But uh, we're concerned about what you might do behind our property. Uh, you know, I don't mind, people have always gone up and down the riverbanks to fish and do different things. But when you talk about putting a trail or a greenway down through there, if, I don't care what you do with the county farm. If you want to make a park out of it, that's entirely the county's property. But uh, the, the other property out there, you need to separate these two plans and be sure you look at it. Uh, it was evidently put over on the side as long as I was commissioner because they knew I was not going to support that. I did support a greenway down the old railroad track. If they want to go down that old railroad track all the way to the Flat River, they're going to they go cross it at the trussle down there, go all the way to the Durham County line. I don't have a problem with that. That property already belongs to, to, the, to the railroad. And if they're willing to give you a right of way to use that, which I understand they said they probably would, that's fine. But take that Greenway plan, set it up on the side. I appreciate it. And I want to thank all of you all for taking a look at this. And uh, keep it in mind, I'm not just speaking for me. I was just getting a phone call. You heard my phone ringing back up a minute ago from one of my neighbors. So uh, they're not going to talk me into running again, I don't think. <laughs> but I want to thank you all for what you do. I've been on the other side of the fence. So I know where you're sitting at. But do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Brandon Vernon of Blackett Road, Roxboro. Good morning. Good morning. I'm I'm here to speak in favor of the um, uh, Greenway plan and the trail system on the county uh, farm. I, I'm I'm a mountain biker and I and I hike and. I go places and spend money uh, doing that, and I think it would be a great benefit. Um, I'm not sure what other uses the uh, county farm could have. Uh, I'm sure you could go in there and cut all the trees down and uh, sell it for subdivision. I'm sure these folks that are in opposition uh, to the trails would probably be more opposed to that. But um, anyway, I, you know, I'm not sure exactly. Um, what people think is going to happen with those trails, uh, but I think it would be a, a, a benefit. And really, uh, when I go other places, I think that the community um, benefits uh, a lot from uh, a trail system and uh, people being outdoors. And uh, anyway, I just wanted to voice my um, my opinion about it and and hope that you vote in favor. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Mr. Jonathan Woods, Fort Junction Road, Timberlake. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I live on the Flat River, right there across from y'all's public farm, or county farm, I don't remember. I saw that live stream that uh, was done on May 17th, and that gentleman was saying all these wonderful things about that river. I've lived on that river for 16 years. You ain't gonna get kayaking. You ain't gonna get canoeing. Ain't hardly no fish in that river. You wanna catch smallest fish? Go to the flat river. Catch the biggest fish? Go to the lakes. You wanna do a greenway trail? That's fantastic. Uh, up and down the uh, railroad tracks, goes from Durham, Roxborough. That'd be fantastic. I know a lot of people like that. I also don't really like a whole bunch of random people buying my house. They were talking about uh, 150,000 people went to Mayo. They said, oh, three times larger park at the uh, county farm. That's three times the amount of people. Uh, I don't think we're going to get that. The uh, Little River has a park, pretty much exactly what they were talking about. Suggest you look into that, see how many people go there. Little River is a uh, good representation of the Flat River. There's nothing there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
And our last speaker is Ms. Anderson Clayton of Stone Drive, Roxborough. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, I live in Roxborough now, or just recently, but uh, my home is 546 Flat River Church Road. Um, I'm also here in support of Greenway Trails and more opportunities for people to have places to come and live and exist in Person County that's outside. Um, the nature here is absolutely beautiful and Flat River is one of the places that I love in this county and I, I grew up on. My family's lived there for generations um, and Flat River Church Road is um, one of the most beautiful places I feel like exists in this county. Um, so I'm here to speak in favor of that. I'm also here to say thank you so much to everyone who came out yesterday and supported the Person County Democrats. Um, we had an amazing stew and turkey leg fundraiser, and we also have a meeting tonight uh, at 100 North Main Street. Um, so it's at 7 p.m. Anybody can come. It's also available on Zoom for anyone that's interested. So thank you all so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. That that's it. That concludes. Next on the agenda is item number one, motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. Commissioner would like to make a motion to approve. A motion to approve. Any discussion? All in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed? No, motion carried. Old business item number two, uh, resolution of adoption of the Person County and City of Rossford joint, joint comprehensive land use plan. Um, I would say the Board of Commissioners conducted the a duly advertised public hearing for review and adoption of the Person County and City of Rossboro Joint Comprehension Land Use Plan at its meeting on November 1st, 2021. Upon motion by Commissioner Gentry, the Board of Commissioners unanimously on November 1st, 2021 to postpone action to adopt the Person County and City of Rossboro Joint Comprehensive Land Use Plan until the Board of Commissioners meeting uh, on November 15th today. And this item is up for board discussion and action at this time. So uh, comments, discussions. Thank you. Uh, yeah, my understanding, and I'll ask the, the county manager, the attorney to weigh in, this is a wish list. This, this comprehensive plan does not have the force and effect of zoning or laws. It is just a wish plan of what we'd like to see the future joint cooperation between city and county. It's just a plan that doesn't have any teeth of implementation. Is that my understanding? It is a document that lays out some plans for how we would like to see development unfold. Most items that require planning and require zoning decisions come to the planning board, come to the county commissioners. This is just a comprehensive land use plan that starts laying out some visions that we can go back to and make sure that the decisions that are being made are consistent with those visions that have been agreed upon. So if, if residents have um, questions or they don't like, uh, like Mr. Allen mentioned on page 90, he doesn't like the, the verbiage, the structure, the, the, the lineage of what happened here. At, at a point in time, can, can this comprehensive plan be modified or changed based on public input down the road? Can the public request this? And how do they do that? What do you think? Well, let me answer that. Thank you. Uh, obviously, yes. Uh, the comprehensive plan, first of all, is required by law, mm -hmm. specifically by statute. It, um, the board is required if you're going to exercise your authority for zoning and subdivision regulation and other uh, land use regulatory authority that you have. Uh, you have to first uh, carefully consider what you have done and are doing. Uh, and eventually adopt a guiding comprehensive plan. It's a general framework, a guidance document to give you the baseline, so to speak, and to guide the board in future 
decisions. And you will make, the board will make all kinds of specific future decisions about land use matters, zoning, um, and everything else that is addressed in that plan. For example, greenways, since they've been mentioned, um, that plan, uh, the comprehensive plan that is before you um, in, uh, in the instances where it mentions or generally addresses greenways and parks and that sort of thing. Uh, there are many future decisions to be made by the board if the board ever chooses to go in those directions. And obviously, uh, every, everyone in our country who owns private property has um, very specific and broad constitutional, constitutional guarantee property rights. Um, which the board and every other unit of government is, is certainly uh, bound to respect. And part of my job, obviously, as county attorney is to advise the board about what the law allows and requires. What is the, just run the last question, sorry, what is the mechanism to um, alter change? I mean, they, they had a steering committee, Mr. Chair, Chairman, you were on that steering yes. committee. Yeah. What's the mechanism for doing that? How is it? How is something like that called into Do you order? Want to come up and answer, Lori. So is your question how how would future amendments or changes to the comprehensive plan be brought before the board? I think so. Okay. So at any point, this comprehensive plan can be adopted. I mean, it can be amended. It's a living document, um, recognizing that it could be amended by both the city or the county um, if they see changes that come that need to be made. Um, just kind of further elaborating on what was previously asked, this is a very general document. Um, that I know there's been a lot of talks about greenways. Our specific document says to provide high quality parks and recreational opportunities. It's not site specific. It doesn't say that county farms should be developed as this. Um, it does reference back to a master parks and recs plan that they recognize as being updated through the parks and rec department. It's not site specific, it's very general. So mm -hmm. um, just keep that in mind. Again, it's not zoning law. It's not like your zoning ordinance. It's a recommendation, but at any point, if the board decides this needs to be amended, definitely we can take it through the process to amend it. If I could just further add about the uh, Parks and Recreation Plan, that was just part of the that was just part of the background research. We did not incorporate any of the recommendations from that plan into the comprehensive plan because it's not completed. And so we don't have any specific recommendations in the joint comprehensive land use plan okay. regarding recreation with the exception of what Lori just read to you know, support uh, the continuation of high quality services. We don't specifically name projects that should be completed. Okay, Th thank you so much. So, so I guess my take on this and, and you guys can weigh in on this too, is that the citizens just have to understand that this is just a plan it's a wish list it's a it's a we this is what we'd like to see in the future but it doesn't have the effect of zoning or law and you at any time have a right to step up and say i oppose or i agree or i want more information at any point in time it's in the citizens hands going forward correct <clears throat> and generally sitting on that uh, committee. Uh, I, I agree with everything you said. I, it is just a general plan. We aren't uh, mandating anything. It's a recommendation. The only thing mandated about it was that we do it. And uh, so we've done that beginning back in maybe late 2018 when we first started this process. And uh, in lots of meetings uh, in between in the interim, um, I think in May of maybe 2020, uh, the, the entire county uh, department heads were invited to participate. And the public had a um, survey that could have been completed uh, in, in 2020 as well from both city and county. 
uh, in the fall of 2020, uh, Mr. Epley was, uh, he presented information to the governing boards regarding the progress of the project. So it's been adver advertised, it's been talked about. And uh, as mentioned previously, uh, I think it's been very open. Um, those meetings were um, uh, live streamed and um, lots of participation, lots of thoughts put in it. But again, there aren't mandates here. It's only complying with the um, uh, law that we developed this plan and uh, not, not to back us in a corner without any options in the future. So uh, again, as Ms. Oakley stated, it's a living ongoing plan. And if we see some things that, that aren't working, then we have the option of changing those things. Mr. Chair, uh, based on the information that's been presented today, uh, I certainly uh, support the resolution adoption of the Person County City of Rossburg Joint Comprehensive Plan Land Use. Thank you for those who have commented. And thank you for the questions you've asked. But as you said, it's a wish list. It's not etched in stone. One question regarding the city council has already approved this um, land use plan. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Any amendment? Let's say hypothetically, we, as the uh, former commissioner mentioned, setting the greenway part aside so that citizens can get a better understanding of that. So you can have less inheritance, what would be the impact that the city has already approved that and the, the county would potentially choose a, a different plan minus that language? Yes, sir. Attorney. As, as a matter of law, and I'll, I'll leave it to the your good planners to talk about good planning practice, but as a matter of law, uh, there's no requirement that the comprehensive plan adopted by the county board of commissioners and the comprehensive plan adopted by the Roxborough City Council be exactly the same. I mean, you all have chosen to work together um, appropriately uh, on behalf of all the citizens uh, in the county, those who live within the city of Roxborough and those who don't, uh, but you're not, you're not bound to that. In the future, you can, the Board of Commissioners, if you choose in the future, certainly can. You have the, uh, the authority and the discretion to um, adopt some provisions that are somewhat different from those adopted by the Roxburgh City Council. So then this becomes not a comprehensive joint comprehensive plan. It's two separate plans then? It would be the county's comprehensive plan that might in the future be somewhat different probably not very much, but somewhat different from the conference plan adopted. It negates the, all the work that's been that's done. Right. That kind of, kind of doesn't make sense. But so just, just to, to reiterate the, the, from what I read and what you said is that the designation that we want to have greenways and parks and whatnot, there's nothing specific, although there's some maps that kind of outline where they could possibly be. I think this is the confusion where they're saying, here's, here's where it could be. We don't have we don't maps have in this document. Okay. All right. Well, somebody had, somebody had mentioned there had been maps, and I hadn't seen them, so I'm, I'm wanting to clarify that. There are no maps in the plan about okay. the Greenway, and really, it's simply just a paragraph acknowledging that there is a Parks and Recreation That's National where it's plan. coming from. Okay. There's, no, there's nothing specific that says uh, the county's planning to do Greenway trails. All right. Uh, so then some of the confusion maybe that, that citizens have is that the Parks and Recreation has a plan but it is a preliminary plan. It hasn't been approved either. Is that correct? Do you know? It has not been a- Is that right, John? So we have an active plan. An active plan is adopted in 2014. That's the plan that we're currently moving on. Uh, we're in the process of updating that plan because these plans are typically 10 year plans. Um, and they are basically our guidelines of how um, you want to run your park system. So they're, they change all the time. So that's a living, breathing document too then. Okay. Yeah. All right. Are you, are you, are you clear with, with that? I mean, if we leave the language as it is, we're still clear mm -hmm. of, of that inclusion. Is that correct? 
Is that the way we understand it? Yes, and going back to that amendment, I think if there are changes made, city and county planning staff would work together to bring it to both boards, because ideally we would like to keep this comprehensive plan between both jurisdictions, um, unless for some reason the city council says absolutely not, we don't want the change that the county is proposing or vice versa. Um, but ideally any changes that come, um, the city planning director and myself would work through the process jointly to try to keep it a joint plan. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So at this point, Mr. Chairman, do you need a motion yes. to move forward on a vote? Yes. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to move forward that uh, make a motion that we vote um, in a um, support of the joint comprehensive plan between the city and the county. That I believe is a motion to adopt the resolution. Correct. I'm sorry. Yes. Thank you. Plan. Uh, you've heard the motion. Any further comments, discussion? All in favor of the motion as presented, say aye. 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 Opposed? Non motion carried. Thank you, folks. Thank, Thank you. you. Item number three on the agenda is Economic Development Task Force summary input uh, from leadership. Uh, is this time to address that general statute, Chairman? Uh, Mr. Chairman, at your discretion. Um, maybe, maybe yes, before we actually begin. There appears to be some misinformation, misunderstanding regarding a meeting Tuesday, November 9th at 1 p.m. of the EDC Task Force and County Commissioners. I believe there should be some clarity on special call meetings and I'll ask Attorney Hankins to address uh, this matter at this time. Oh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I, I don't have much to say, but uh, the, uh, the chair called me last week on behalf of the board uh, just to, to clarify the procedures that are required by law about how a special meeting of the Board of Commissioners can be called. Um, there, just some quick review. Um, the statutes provide for three different kinds of meetings for the Board of Commissioners and other public bodies. One is a regular meeting like this one, and this board holds two regular meetings each month. The legal significance of that is that the board is free in a regular meeting to consider any matter that the board chooses to uh, put on the agenda including amendments to the agenda to add items. A special meeting is different. Let me mention the third one first, an emergency meeting. That means the hurricane is on the way and we need to meet right now to decide some things. Those are rare. Special meeting is a little more common um, and the law is different. In a special meeting, the board can consider only the matters that are mentioned in a notice of the special meeting. And that notice is the thing that schedules and calls, so to speak, the special meeting. How many commissioners are required to sign the notice to call a special meeting? Your um, rules of procedure that the board previously adopted are very specific about that. And those rules are consistent with the statute. Uh, rule six in your rules of procedure say exactly what the statute says, GS 153A-40, that um, the chairman alone, the person you all, the board elected as the chair, can sign a notice of special meeting on behalf of the board and call a special meeting. Or, the statute says, and your rules say, that a majority of the board can sign a notice of a special meeting. And obviously, in the case of this board, that's three of the five members as a majority. So those are the two ways and the only two ways to call a special meeting, whether it's a, a meeting just of this board or a special meeting uh, to be held jointly with another public body. Happy to answer questions. Questions of the attorney? 
Okay, and your point, Mr. Chairman? I'm sorry. And your point? Well, well we wanted clarity. Okay, uh, clarity on exactly what? Procedures. Okay. Should call a special meeting. Okay, so who called for a special meeting? Anyone? <laughs> Very good question. Lots of confusion. Lots of misinformation, I believe, and misunderstandings. I'll no, say, uh, no, me... I don't. I, I disagree with you in all due respect, sir. Um, the task last commissioner's meeting, the presentation was very rudely interrupted, and we did not get to complete the information and the facts that we wanted to present. The task force was very dis distraught about the fact that the communications were just shut down. It was almost like, well, let's uh, let's kill the messenger and not listen to the message. And that's fine. However, the task force requested a meeting with the, with the Board of Commissioners. As the liaison, I sent an email out to the entire board twice, asking you if you would meet with the task force. Three members of this Board of Commissioners did not have the courtesy to respond to that email. Is that correct, Carney Manager? So the task force went ahead and had a public meeting with due notice of 48 hours. And they sat in this chamber last Wednesday afternoon and clarified what the, they had done, the work they had done, and the findings. And it was recorded and it's posted on the public website. So, I'm not quite sure why the county commissioners wouldn't want to meet with a task force of businessmen, citizens of this county, as you did with the Builders Association when they had issues with the governance. I can tell you why I didn't want to meet. Uh, I wanted to uh, talk with the task force members uh, and Sorry if this offends you, but I want to talk to the task force members with the task force. I did not want uh, Commissioner Gentry there. She, based on our last presentation, um, I wanted to hear uh, with the county, uh, with the task force individually or as a group. But I'll say this, when I tried to see if I could make that meeting, Commissioner Gentry, it was less than 48 hours and I, could, I couldn't attend that meeting. But the reason I want to talk to the task force again uh, as individuals, which I did, I did talk to uh, an individual with the task force, asked them questions, and, um, and it was a good it was an hour long meeting. So I felt good about that. And um, that's, what, that's the reason why. Anyone else? Well, I would like the opportunity to kind of clarify a few things that weren't finished. Mr. Commissioner Perrier seemed very upset and grandstanding about the fact that he didn't get a copy of a report prior to the meeting. Well, there was no official report. And if you had listened clearly to my statement, there is no report given to this body because there is nothing for this body to vote on. The information from the task force was really a learning experience for me. But what we did is we probably looked at a dozen counties that had different models. We chose four different models. And we invited someone here from another county that had almost 20 years of economic development experience to lay out the model that they used to build their engine, their financial engine that assisted their economic development process. And instead of listening, did you turn this off? Oh, there, I'm sorry. Instead of listening to the message of how they developed a business model, it was an attack on trying to communicate the differences between the sizes of the county and the population. And that was not the point of the presentation. The point of the presentation was to say, this is how we did it. This is what we did. This was the process. We could have had any four of the counties that we identified come in and said the same thing. 
We just brought in an expert to come in and say, here's what's needed, here's what will work. Um, I, I just found it really interesting. Um, back in 1915, the chamber was formed to advance business interest in the town and the county. In 1951, the public, there was a public drive to raise $10,000 to promote Roxborough and Person County. That's the public sector. And between 1950 and 1955, the RDC, the Roxborough Development Corporation, was established. Private entity was established to promote economic and industrial development in Person County. We brought in Crown Manufacturing, reinforced plastics container, and there was interest at the time from Coca-Cola and the Pepsi-Cola bottling plant. In 1955, the RDC persuaded the Roxborough Manufacturing Company to stay with over 500 employees. And in 1956, the RDC stated the outlook for attracting new industry is better now than it has been at any time since the founding of the corporation. In 1957, they had four industrial prospects in line out of the 15 that had looked at Person County at that period of time. And at that time in 1958, the county tax rate was 1.55, substantially higher than it is today. And in 1956, the Merchants Association was a division and part of the chamber. In 1960, Roxborough and person business, uh, city business leaders created the Committee of 100, which was private citizens interested in industrial development meeting with the RDC to pledge support for a go forward program. And their first option was 157 acres in the Somerset Industrial Park. So I'm saying that the suggestions that the task force brought, and we brought forth first and floated the opportunity and the idea to the chamber. Whether or not they decide to take it up is up to them. It's just an idea of what we can do. And I'm also here to say that it's been done before in the community. So I don't understand the resistance to looking at new ideas and new information. Because Mr. Mr. Commissioner Perrier, you've been on this board for over a decade. Are you pleased with the progress we have made? in economic development. Are we, are we just doing great? I've got 15 different articles from the Business Journal of communities all around us that are exploding with growth. We're one of five counties in North Carolina that's had a negative growth rate in the last decade and the rest of North Carolina's on fire. And I'm saying here, I understand that we're a rural county. I understand that we don't have all the major interstates that everybody would like to have. But what we do have is something we need to capitalize on. And so these are ideas, information. We have to be curious about what's possible. Because if we keep doing the status quo, we're going to keep getting what we're getting. Are you happy with that? Mr. Chairman, before I give my comments, I, the agenda item presented before us is to hear from um, the entities that would be involved of this, um, um, the private pu uh, public pro partnership. I'd like to begin item number three. Okay. And, and I'm in agreement with you. Uh, and my, I, and my I will only, reserve my comments to, to please, the end of this item. Please don't mean to interrupt your train of thought there. But uh, there has been uh, in the past several days uh, what I consider a misunderstanding about. Uh, a special call meeting and why. And that's why I asked the attorney uh, to address its statute and our policy and procedure. So uh, for clarity there and, and uh, putting this all out for the public, uh, I would like to say a few words. As chairman, I didn't receive a direct request for a joint meeting on Tuesday, November 9th, nor was there a vote by a majority of the board of commissioners for a joint meeting of the two bodies on that date. There was a, quote, press release submitted, end quote, to send to the board clerk. However, there was no official meeting of the task force and board of commissioners scheduled, only a meeting between some members of the two bodies. 
Additionally, the meeting was not live streamed because it was not an official meeting. Since the meeting was not called for by the majority of the board members or by the chairman, it did not meet the statutory requirements of, quote, a meeting. Furthermore, had more than two commissioners attended, the, the meeting would have violated this statute as well. Once a quorum has been met, there are many procedural requirements that this board must meet prior to said meeting. And I hope this clears up any misinformation or misunderstanding surrounding this matter. And in closing, I want to say that the majority of the citizens of Person County know me, the virtues by which I stand, and my sincere desire that my elected positions on the school board and the board of commissioners to be those that live both entities, as well as the citizens of Person County, in a better place. Each of you are also aware that I am not one to get angry and lash out, but I too have a breaking point. That being said, I have been extremely disappointed with some of the occurrences during recent commissioner meetings. And for that, I apologize to the citizens of Person County. As chairman, I am responsible for not only the meeting agendas, but the decorum in which they are conducted. Moving forward, I will strive to ensure that this decorum will not only be enforced upon the public, but on the sitting board of members, sitting board members as well. Simply put, this has to get better before we can move forward as a team for the betterment of Person County. I also wish to remind each and every citizen that I am available for any personal conversation. I encourage every citizen to not be swept up in the rumor mill that social media can be. I simply refuse to be a part of such. I can be reached by my county email at your convenience, and I will gladly work towards setting up a face-to-face -face meeting. End of my comments and uh, Commissioner per year. Go ahead with your comments there, sir. Mr. Chairman, I would want to proceed with item three. Proceeding with. I have a question and then just a question of clarification. I see that the chamber, the EDC, the Roxborough Uptown and the tourism, they're all weighing in on the task force recommendations However, the only, the only entity that we ever approached with the idea was the chamber. So none of the other entities were approached for their, for their input. So I just wanna make a note of that. Question, did we not, you said just the uh, Chamber of Commerce, did you not uh, mention the EDC in this as well? Or no, EDC was not mentioned? You the said current, the entities no, that- I, I, and I, no, I, I'm just, I'm saying that, that we were working, uh, the task force was working for, for looking for ways to help our current EDC. This is a private, this is not, our EDC is a government body. This is a private task force. I mean, the task force was looking for private entity involvement. So we floated the idea to the chamber because they're a private entity. They are a nonprofit corporation whose mission is to lead, promote, support the business environment in the global economy, improve the quality of life for Roxborough and Person County. And you can go to their website and you can check out their calendar of events. Mr. Chair, I'm okay with the ones that are on this list and for them to go ahead and give their presentation. I'm fine. Um... Commissioner Gendry, Economic Development Task Force Liaison, uh, presented findings and a summary of the Board of, to the Board of County Commissioners on November 1st, 2021. Uh, Vice Chair uh, per year made a motion that carried to continue this item to the board's next meeting on November 15th, of course, which is today, to allow leadership from the Chamber of Commerce, the Tourism Development Aid Authority, EDC and the Uptown Development Group and any entities mentioned in the task force summary uh, to read, review, and provide input to the Board of Commissioners. So that essentially is why we're here today. And uh, the first one listed there is 
Roxburgh Area Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Woody Jacobs. Come, come forward, please. And Thank you for well, allowing me to speak today. I consider it a privilege. I'm Woody Jacobs, and I volunteer, volunteer with the Roxborough Area Chamber of Commerce and currently serve as the chairman of the board. I've served on this board for five years and in this present role for one year. Colin Powell <clears throat> was considered one of the most popular and admired leaders in America. The following quote is one that he used often, not just in words, but also in his actions. Leadership is all about people. It is not about organizations. It is not about plans. It is not about strategies. It is all about people motivating people to get the job done. You have to be people-centered, end of quote. I start with this because I believe that somewhere along the way, it seems that the Board of Commissioners has lost sight of this. Instead of focusing on motivating people and helping others move forward, the focus has been on winning, regardless of who gets knocked down in the process. Instead of being people-centered and building rapport and trust with one another and the community, we've witnessed self-centered interests and division. I'm sure most of you have heard of the term or concept of friendly fire. It's a term often used to describe the travesties that happen in the battlefield or playing field when people are shot down, killed or injured by their own team. Those wearing the same colors representing the same goals and missions the term friendly fire is somewhat of an oxymoron and that there is really nothing friendly about it in fact it is a very real thing and the end result is the same. People are severely injured or killed by those battling right alongside of them. If we could all remember that we're on the same team, regardless of political party affiliation, position, private or public sectors, et cetera, and use our resources to work together, I believe we could truly make a difference. I would like to now transition to the reason I'm standing here before you today. I would like to define more fully the role that we have as a Chamber of Commerce and how we work with others to positively affect economic development. Also, I want to bring clarity and understanding to any misinformation that has been passed along. As an organization that represents 329 members of the local business community, we are grateful for the opportunity to public speak for ourselves for the first time since this discourse began. We value the work and responsibility of the Board of Commissioners, our partners in the EDC and the TDA, and what we believe was a positive intent from the individual members of the appointed task force to assist in moving Person County forward. We always welcome collaboration and encourage input from our members and partners on how we can best be of service. And we are grateful to have been invited here today. Our role at the rate at the Chamber of Commerce is to lead, to promote, and support our local business community, 
The mission has been implemented for the last 86 years in countless ways for thousands of businesses alongside a multitude of partners. The ways in which we support our business community have evolved over the years and must continue to evolve. We know that. We support that evolution. We are actively working to pursue it. I believe we all want positive change for Person County. And you can be certain that this chamber will continue to do our part through strengthening our relationships with our core groups. We have so much work to do as an organization and a community. So much good and important work, but we cannot do it like this. We cannot lead our business community by acting on ill prepared whims without strategic vision or genuine collaboration. We cannot promote our business community while we publicly attacked by people who have never before bothered to engage with our organization. We cannot support our business community in the middle of an ever shifting pandemic, an economic downturn, a hostile political environment, racial unrest and inequality, a severe staffing shortage, or even in the brightest of days, if we are distracted by insensitive and uninformed demands, we cannot and we will not. As a member of the Roxborough Area of Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors, we were highly disappointed in the misinformation, lack of communication, and sheer unprofessionalism that took place at your November 1st meeting. It is not my intent to point the finger at any one person or to take sides or to create more division and disunity among the board of commissioners. With that being said, much of this is directed at the comments and feedback that were presented by Commissioner Gentry in that meeting. I'd like to address some of those items now. In Commissioner Gentry's three-page document summarizing the task force findings, she stated, and I quote, that Person County to date relies solely on funding granted by the Board of Commissioners and no active private community participation in EDC process. The EDC has no real power and no achievements of true merit, end of quote. These are examples among many of the blanket statements that were used to portray a picture of failure. They simply do not represent the facts. Additionally, I do not think they truly reflect the findings given by the task force. One of the things that Mac Williams mentioned during his presentation last week, which we greatly appreciate his time in doing so, he mentioned participation in the Duke Site Readiness Program as one form of public-private partnership. In 2014, Duke Energy selected the Person County Megasite for this exact program. And in 2019, followed up with an additional grant for obtaining engineering and environmental permits necessary for site development. But it's worth noting that Duke Energy continues to support economic development and workforce development efforts in Person County. Just a few topical examples include 2014, $32,500 for site readiness program designation and support. 2016, $248,000 workforce development grant for person for Piedmont Community College. 2019, $20,000 to Piedmont Community College Workforce Development Grant. 2019, $25,000 economic development grant for mega site. 2021, $25,000 to Uptown Roxboro hometown grants. That's over $350,000. in support that is considered public-private partnership funding. 
These funds do not come out of the county budget. And Duke support goes beyond just funding. The Duke Energy team bought in site selection consultants at Duke's cost to review and provide feedback on Person County's economic development activities. Additionally, Duke Energy regularly assisted with project lead generation and has, and has provided additional support for projects with Pollywood, the Eden Expansion, and Spuntech. As a Duke Energy employee, this information was readily available to me, but anyone can find this information through simple research. I don't want to spend and speak for others, but there are major employers in this county, and I feel certain that there are more private partners providing funding and support for economic development. It is truly a team effort. The mission of the Economic Development Task Force, as stated in the November 1st meeting presentation was to review and provide the Board of Commissioners with the economic development prototype that will provide a source of increased economic funding by means of a revised organizational structure, which will better serve economic development needs for Person County. What we were given in the summary was a one sentence recommendation from the task force and some additional comments. The rest of the three page summary appears to be cut and paste sound bites from the economic development directors of other counties that were interviewed by the task force. Commissioner Gentry stated on November the 1st in the meeting that she tried unsuccessfully to meet with the chamber for eight weeks because they were closed down preventing her from the opportunity to meet with our team until September 18th. We did in fact sit down with her as an executive board on Wednesday, August the 18th. This is a misrepresentation of the facts. Did I not clarify that in an email that you were correct that I had the, the dates wrong from August to September? Did you, you not receive an email from me saying you, you're right? You clarified it with me. You did not clarify it with the public. It is worth noting. I just clarified it. You're right. It is worth noting that like many other entities in our community, the chamber faced staffing challenges this summer as we rallied as a team to remain open and serve members while our executive director was out of the office on a much more important job of her own, maternity leave. While Ms. Bagby was out of the August for, office for eight weeks, the chamber was closed for a total of three business days, not 40. Additionally, it should be noted that we asked our director on August the 18th to join us after working hours on her third day back in the office with the newborn at home and many pressing items on her regular agenda because we felt that your request, Commissioner Gentry, was important and worthy of prompt attention. We welcomed you to our table, anticipating a valuable discussion and instead received what we now see as a demand disguised as a presentation. You have made it clear since the, that evening and in our interaction since that discussion was never part of your agenda. Moreover, we fully support the work that our executive director, Ms. Bagby, is doing in reevaluating and collaborating with the EDC and the TDA. Ms. Bagby has only been in this role for one year and we are seeing great results in that time. Rather than getting to know our organization and asking questions that could have helped equip this task force and our partners at the EDC, you bypass an opportunity to listen. Rather than asking how you could help and seeking to serve as a partner, you belittled our staff and leadership, both privately and publicly. 
rather than you clarify to facilitate, that excuse me sir can you excuse clarify, me please can you Mr. clarify Woody, that the floor could please continue sir rather than having to facilitate collaboration between the chamber the edc the task force and peers you provided one suggestion that a private non-profit organization the Roxborough Area Ch Chamber of Commerce spend limited membership dollars to hire a recommended consultant. And by the way, that we do it now without further consideration. Unfortunately, that is not how rural community development works. It is a shame that we stand here today in defense of our own organization and partners when we have been here all along, working collaboratively to turn the ship, eager to facilitate change. It is an even greater shame that we as a chamber now are part of a clear pattern. A pattern that our community and those who might consider joining our community are watching unfold. As one local entity after another has been the target of a similar agenda, or should I say, a target of friendly fire. We can do better than this. I ask you commissioners, what makes you most proud of our community? I'm proud of the five new businesses owners we have celebrated in just the last two weeks. One of the new businesses and their owners were celebrated in the past week, had a choice in where they would open their site. They chose Parson County because, and I quote, the people, resources, love and community found in Person County. I'm proud of the fact that Person County is in the top 20 counties in North Carolina for annual average wage. I'm proud of the fact the actual collaborative spirit and real world examples of partnership and camaraderie that exist amongst our organizations who are driving change, supporting businesses, and promoting tourism to our beautiful county. I open my remarks by quoting Colin Powell, and I will close by quoting Colin Powell. The tie that binds us are stronger than the occasional stresses that separate us. And again, leadership is not about, it is all about people. It is not about organizations. It is not about plans. It is not about strategies. It's all about people motivating people to get the job done. You have to be people-centered. If you don't remember anything else that I've said today, remember that as leaders who are setting the example, we need to come together and be people-centered. Working together as one until the five member board of commissioners can become more unified, people centered teams. All the plans and strategies will be in vain. I employ you as the leadership of Person County. Great rewards will come to those who live together, learn together, work together. Let's forge this new tie that binds us together. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gordon. Next is. 
I would like to clarify. I would like to clarify for the record that I met with the chamber executive committee and I floated an idea. There were never any demands of participation. There were never any demands on you whatsoever from this commissioner. And in fact, Mr. Jacobs called me several weeks later and said, we like these ideas that you presented and we're gonna work forward, going forward with the, with the other partners in the community. That was it. That is the only communications that I have had with the chamber. Mr. Philip Allen, Economic Development Commission. <clears throat> Thank you, Commissioner Powell. Board of Commissioners. Good morning. Appreciate the opportunity to come and talk about the EDC. First of all, with reference to the EDC, I'm very proud to serve uh, on the EDC as its chairman. We've got a wonderful board. It's made up of representatives of both the private and the public sector. Our members include uh, Donna Long, Danny Talbert, Dale Reynolds, who is our vice chair, and he sends his regrets. He's in, at a trade show in uh, Las Vegas. The mayor of Roxborough, Marilyn Newell, our chairman of the Board of Commissioners, Gordon Powell, Kenneth Perry, who was a former chairman of the EDC. Those are our voting members. We also have broad representation from our ex officio members. Uh, Rodney Peterson, uh, superintendent of public schools. Pamela Senegal, president of Piedmont Community College. Barry Hill, Farmland Preservation, Heidi York, County Manager, and Brooks Lockhart, our City Manager. We are also, I'm also very proud and want to go on the record in support of our Director, Sherry Wilton. She does an excellent job. She works all the time <clears throat> and proud to serve with her. I'll also state this, is that uh, I have not talked to but one member of our board. So the comments that I'm gonna make have not been presented before our board. We will meet next Tuesday at our regular scheduled meeting. We will talk about uh, this presentation, but these are my comments and feelings about the EDC. Uh, I'm gonna take us back to, to back in January of this year, after Commissioner PJ Gentry made her presentation of the proposed task force to the Board of Commissioners. We invited her to present to our EDC board. I opened the remarks by stating this. There is one word that always gets our attention. And that word is funding. I believe it was mentioned almost 20 times during the course of your presentation, uh, Commissioner Gentry, <clears throat> because in the absence of proper funding, we are challenged to make the needed investments in infrastructure, product development and inventory, spec buildings, land acquisition, industrial parks, incentives and other items related to the economic development. I close by saying that our board should not only welcome, but endorse discussions and conversation about funding. Commissioner Gentry was invited to our January board meeting and she indicated in that meeting that the intention was not to dismantle or blow up the current EDC board, but instead to restructure the board's funding. So at the close of her presentation, our board voted unanimously 
to endorse the proposed creation of the task force. So at this point, fast forward to a couple of weeks ago, I'm a bit confused now with the task force recommendation, which stated, build a cooperative model between public funding and private funding, partner with the Chamber of Commerce, tourism, business and county government. So my confusion is it does county government mean the current person county EDC? Is it currently as it is currently structured? Or will there be a plan either now or in the future to reconstruct the entire organization? Don't know. I'd also like to respectfully at this time disagree with the statement in the report that states there is no active private community participation in the EDC process. And the EDC has no real power and has no achievements of true merit. Well, I would submit to this board, this community, that this past summer, we celebrated the announcement of Pollywood, the Pollywood expansion that will create an additional 300 jobs on top of the 385 initially pledged. This will double the footprint, creating the largest manufacturing facility in this county at nearly 1 million square feet. So just to get a visual of 1 million square feet, if you look at the Peebles and the Tractor Supply Shopping Center, that's roughly 100,000 square feet. So roughly 10 times the size of that space. This was a big deal and a big achievement and a big win for Person County. 700 jobs, almost $100 million in investment, and a million square feet. I would say that that's an achievement of true merit. It is wonderful news when an industry, an existing industry, announces an expansion <clears throat> because it's validation that your community is doing it right. Hollywood would not have expanded here had they not chosen to come here originally. They could go anywhere else after that. They said they chose to come because of the responsiveness of Sherry Wilbur, our director and the community support that they received. Their first trip in town took place at the Piedmont Community College campus and involves business support presentations from the city, the county, the community college, and the state of North Carolina, and the local chamber of commerce, the Recycling Center, Economic Development Commission, Hollywood has expressed gratitude for the level of support they have received with permitting, upgrades, recycling programs, hiring and training the 410, hiring and training the 410 employees that are already here. And the overall appreciation of their presence here in Person County and the positive business climate here. This was a collaboration of all these organizations, a collaboration of all these organizations and a true team effort led by our director, Sherry Wilkin, and all the rest of the stakeholders. In the announcement 
And this is a compliment to our entire community. In the announcement, Doug Rassi, who is the CEO of Hollywood said, we came because of the building, but we stayed because of the people. We came because of the building, but we stayed because of the people. That's the ultimate compliment. Next item, that we continue to receive private and community participation in the economic development process. <clears throat> As Mr. Jacobs pointed out, Duke Energy continues to be the strongest of strong partners with both funding and with their expertise. We get the same type of participation also exists from Dominion Energy and Piedmont Electric. We also have private industry partners that support workforce development, schools, and partner organizations through donations and volunteering. Our economic development efforts have also been supported over the years by the Golden Leaf Foundation, the Rural Infrastructure Authority, and the other state and federal grant programs. Earlier this year, the EDC also put out a request for proposals for a private partner to participate in a public-private partnership. Our director is in constant contact with the directors of the chamber, the TDA, and the Uptown Development Group, as well as other county departments and the city of Roxburgh. This is important for all, for all our day-to-day -day efforts in the promotion of the county. Dr. Senegal of Piedmont Community College has accompanied Sherry on site visits. Chamber President has accompanied Sherry on existing industry visits. TDA, TDA has been involved with the business support with business overlaps. Uptown Roxborough tracks commercial and residential vacancies for our director to share with prospects and developers. So there is constant and consistent collaboration. As mentioned before, we have a strong EDC, EDC board that represent both the private and the public sectors. We rely and depend on them in our planning and in our decision-making process. A top priority of the commission was to perform a SWOT analysis and to craft a strategic plan based off that analysis which we began carrying out since its adoption in 2019. As a result of the plan and EDC efforts, critical infrastructure improvements that are necessary for any development in the southern portion of the city and county are now underway. Infrastructure design and construction has been done for the Person County Mega Park and advanced development permits have been received. Another site on the North Park Drive has been brought to a greater level of site readiness through due diligence studies and permitting and the product development is underway. Other efforts include large investments in training and workforce development through the 6-14 workforce pipeline program, given the critical importance of uh, having a skilled workforce in our economic development recruitment efforts. Our board, our board has been busy. In closing, my remarks are the same as when we welcomed Commissioner Gentry to our EDC meeting in January. There's one word that always gets our attention, still, and that word is funding. In the absence of proper funding, we are challenged to make needed investment in infrastructure, product development, and inventory, spec buildings, land acquisition, industrial parks, incentives, and other items related to economic development. I'd like to thank the task force members for their willingness to volunteer. And we look forward to more information on the final model and the funding component. I'd also like to thank the entire Board of Commission Board for their funding and support of economic development and your appropriation this year and your unanimous support for the Hollywood project.
We appreciate your efforts. We appreciate your efforts. <clears throat> Finally, I'd like to thank our director, Cherry Wilbur, and all the members of the EDC for their contributions and dedication. Remember that economic development is a team sport. And if we work together, then we can make some, some great things happen. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak today. I'm grateful for the opportunity to volunteer to make Preston County the place we love a better place for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Allen. I have a question. I have a question yes, for you. Has there been any mention anywhere with the task force or from me personally that there isn't collaboration between departments in the county? I, I got that from the... Uh, when have we mentioned anything about working together? We've been focusing on private funding mechanisms. We haven't attacked anything that's been in place uh, yeah, or well, anybody's communication. The task force recommendation build a cooperative model between public funding and private funding partnering with the chamber. So it's that was a suggestion. Yes, correct. correct. I'm just saying we do collaborate. I know, but we're we're specifically talking collaborating of information is different than collaborating on fundraising. That's okay. that's a different focus. I think it needs to be clarified. And also, um, for the past decade, I think we've had the Hollywood that came here, the expansion, and I believe one other uh, expansion. Is that a significant? Is that? I mean, it, these are good things. And I know Hollywood had a choice to go to another location, and I'm sure that our incentive package probably had something to do with that. But is is this enough for us? Are we considering no, it's not this enough? enough? But it's, it's, it's certainly worth. It's, it's of true merit. It, absolutely, and that has that never been a question. Right, but it was in that three-page handout, whether it was a report or whether it was a summary. We were, or we were talking about the past report. decade. That that is not significant for a decade of work. I'm not saying. I'm just saying that this, this is significant. This is definitely significant. Nobody said otherwise. Okay. I'm not saying that you did. I'm just saying it's, it, it was said there was no true merit. It, nothing was done. Nothing was brought to our community of true merit. This is a true merit. Thank y'all. Thank you, Thank sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. And um, you reiterate something here before we move along. At the previous meeting, we did have a point made about conduct of those in the audience. If uh, you can't maintain quietness, this is not uh, a session where those in the audience are to speak and interrupt this board meeting or our board meetings. So if that can't be done and, and adhered to, then we will ask that you be removed from the building. Uh, next on the list, uh, here in, in this conversation was uh, Roxburgh Uptown uh, and Linda Clayton. And uh, Ms. Clayton could not be here and sent this statement. The Uptown Roxburgh Group appreciates the commissioner's acknowledgement of our role in the community. Given that we were not expressly named in the task force report, we have not prepared any information to present to the commissioner's meeting or at the commissioner's meeting. We maintain our support for our partner agencies and appreciate all the hard work that they're doing for our community. If specific information is needed from our group, please let me know. Otherwise, we will simply remain abreast of the discussions about uh, this topic. So at this point, I think we need to move along with, um, with next steps. And you know, again, I read earlier that couple of things that we are to do, review and provide input to the Board of Commissioners. So what are the proposed next steps uh, for the task force and, and how we move on? Mr. Chair, is the Tourism Development Authority going to speak, Dr. Claudia Berryhill? Oh, I'm sorry. Please come forward, I'm sorry.
Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, good morning. I'm Claudia Berryhill, and I'm chair of the Person County Tourism Development Authority, commonly referred to as TDA or just tourism. And I'd like to thank you for I'm the sorry, opportunity. Sorry, could you speak to, to speak the speak microphone? Today. Could you speak? Thank you. Is that better? Yeah. I thought I was always loud. <clears throat> So we're commonly referred to as TDA or tourism and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. But neither our director nor myself has been approached previously about how tourism fits into Person County's economic development framework and we're anxious to do so. And I'd like to start with the question, what is economic development? Everyone probably has a different take on what it is, how to achieve success, what is success, and what is the end result? We would probably agree the end result is good paying jobs in an area that provides basic necessities of life and amenities that provide fulfillment and enrichment to ourselves and families. Marley Spencer, our TDA director, will follow with her scheduled annual report, which is in your packet. And I'll try not to be redundant, but several reports, several points need to be reinforced. This authority was created by legislation in 1997, such that a tax could be levered, levied to overnight visitors in our motels, our cabins, our inns, and now includes other platforms such as Airbnbs, VRBOs, Expedia, and others. These visitors stay less than 90 days. The legislation also mandates how this money can be spent. It's to further the development of travel and tourism in the county through advertising and promotion, to sponsor tourist-oriented events and activities, and to finance tourist-related capital projects. Person County TDA provides grants that our attractions can apply for and can be used for capital improvements of these attractions. This money can support festivals and other events which bring in folks that spend money on lodging, food, and the like. The six members of the Person County TDA Board are appointed by you all, by the Board of Commissioners and the City Council. Three members each for three-year terms, and one each is designated as a hotel motel operator. So visit North Carolina stats, statistics attributed an economic impact of $35.2 million to Person County in the year 2019 to 2020. So how does the tourism and hospitality industry contribute to economic development in Person County? There are property taxes paid on lodging sites, employees are needed for cleaning, maintenance, repair, and upkeep, and visitors buy. They buy food, they buy gas, they buy ice, trinkets, and gifts. Entrepreneurial businesses such as boat rental startup and artisans provide specialty retail items. Does the TDA actively seek industrial recruitment, retirees, or small businesses outright? No, but we are here to promote awareness of Person County, what we have to offer, to bait the hook, so to speak. Interestingly, occupancy taxes collected are not designated as tourist or corporate by source, and we don't have the official means to differentiate the two sources. But the feeling is, is that the corporate world is the bread and butter of the taxes collected. And as a side note, when I had the uptown apartments for five years, my renters were mostly corporate contract workers and consultants. I had contract hospital personnel and a teacher, but no tax was collected there. And for the past five nights, an out of town roofing contractor has lodged its employees here while replacing a roof on our uptown property. Our Person County Tourism staff consists of one full-time and one part-time employee. And so our staff and our board members assist other organizations such as our chamber, our Uptown Roxborough Group, and our EDC, our county arts, parks, and rec department with their projects and may actively partner on some of the projects as needed. And I watched the task force videos and I'd like to thank the members for their time and effort that went into the evaluating potential strategies to enhance an economic development and also to meet with our commission, commissioners to present their findings and suggestions. I also followed up by talking to TDA directors in several of these counties. In Alamance, they have a staff of two, but there is one vacancy. 
It is a standalone agency with an MOU with the county such that their employees are county employees and the county does all of their administrative tasks such as collecting the money like we do, but they also pay the bills. That TDA sees its function in economic development as to promote the quality of life to attract visitors, which will attract businesses. In Wilson County, there are two part-time employees and one full-time director. They too work cooperatively with their economic development commission, their downtown arm, their chamber. They see their function as to promote the quality of life in Wilson County. Rockingham County is a little different egg. It's economic development, it's small business and tourism. They're all one department and it's under their EDC director, but each of those entities has its own manager. And Randolph never returned my calls. In each of these counties, members of the TDA board were appointed by boards of commissioners and came from seats of various businesses. Their chambers are from the individual municipalities in these counties and also hotel and motel sites. They too, all of these counties were mandated in how their funds can be spent. And it's the same way we're mandated. It has to go back to tourism related entities and expenses. And they also see their function as a, as a means to enhance their quality of life in their counties, attracting visitors and eventually businesses. Now, if I could put on another hat, I would hope that we all agree economic development is not just industrial development. It is supported by tourism, small business development, and our chamber in our Piedmont Community College and their small business arms support our small businesses. Our agricultural community of farms, forest, agritourism, and agribusinesses are also a major contributor to our economic development here. Agriculture is our state and our county's major economic driver and tourism and the military toggle for second and third place in our state economy. Agriculture also contributes in other ways, a quality of life and a way of life. Farmland provides natural beauty, provides the basis of an ecosystem that has a natural balance until we mess it up. And just think about the pollinators now that we need to artificially prop up for our crops and flowers. Agriculture supports the aesthetic and health value of greenways, open spaces, our starry nights and the singing of birds. At the Farm City Breakfast held recently, Linda Loveland from Farm Bureau spoke of the statewide need of broadband for the farming community. She was followed by a presentation given by Jimmy and Timmy Thomas of their farming operation. They farm hundreds of acres in our county. And that operation is largely managed by smartphone apps using GPS technology that tracks where tractors, where trucks and tractors are. They can program tractors and other implements to sow, fertilize, spray, and harvest with this technology, which maximizes yield and minimizes waste, which is a cost savings and protects the land from overuse of chemicals. They employ 30 folks. They have an office manager that works a 40 hour week. So if economic development is thought only of industry, doesn't this farm sound like an industry? So as we look at and plan for our growth, let's practice smart growth. Let's identify what is us, what is the good in us, and to work and enhance to promote what is good for us and in us, and also work collaboratively on fixing what needs to be fixed to make it all better. Thank you, commissioners, for what you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> now, are there next steps and proposals, Commissioner Gentry? No, there's there's nothing for the board to vote on. This was no, just no vote. there's no vote on it. The only proposal would be that. Every economic development program that we looked at had an agreement with the private sector. The, there was a private sector funding mechanism and the county was, um, they had an agreement with their uh, government ED uh, department to work in collaboration. When it gets to the point where it's, whether it's the chamber 
or anyone else that wants to form a committee of 100 to raise funds to support economic development, it can come from any private sector. It doesn't have to be the chamber. It just seemed logical because we're a small community, but that's up to them. There's been no strong arming for this whatsoever. It's all on you guys to decide. So, but if there's other entities or other business people that say, can we form a Roxborough Development Corporation for this? Absolutely, they can do it. And when such is done, then the county should look at working with them in an agreement because that, that is a public-private partnership. And that's, that's when you get to that point, that's what you need to do. Uh, is that not a recommendation from you, your task force members? Well, it's a recommendation, I guess, from the task force is that we get to that point. But right now, I can't make a recommendation because there's no entity to make a recommendation or an agreement with. I'm just saying this is the potential that you have if a group does form for that specific purpose, you would, the county would probably want to work in agreement with them. Am I correct, county manager, or um, attorney? I have examples of several agreements between private uh, economic development, fundraising, and, and public sectors. I mean, I, we've got different agreements examples from different counties so that it is possible that the county would enter an agreement to work with a private sector. The county has um, a, a wide range of discretion and authority to organize the economic development efforts within the county in many different ways as you all see fit working with other entities and to fund those efforts and to fund specific uh, initiatives of of any of those entities. Um, there are several written agreements in place um, currently between uh, Person County uh, and several other entities, public and private. Um, and in whatever direction the Board of Commissioners might choose to go in the future, uh, yes, uh, there certainly is the potential uh, for the county to enter into some additional or different agreements. And at that point, it would become a legal issue. Um, and I would certainly look forward to assisting as appropriate if and when that time comes. Thank you. I, I would love to make a motion to say we should do X, Y, Z. But there's no need for it at this time because all we've done is investigate and present information and findings, try to bring forth as much information as possible. And it's really up to the, it's up to the business community. It's up to the citizens of Person County. Do you wanna enact down a road to do this or not? So you're looking for- I'm not looking else. for anything. Mr. Chair, yes. I just wanted to say a few things. First of all, um, uh, I know I, I, I hate that we uh, went with the gnashing of teeth after our previous meeting over this, the task force. I know they probably didn't know that they were going to be thrown in a bus all over the last uh, couple of weeks where we've been talking about this. Um, but I appreciate what they have done, uh, the task force, the work they put forward. Um, I also thank the people who spoke today uh, about uh, the task force and about their departments. Um, of course, when the decision comes, which is one of something we have talked about, uh, I know this was brought up several years ago. Uh, if you have a private sector, uh, 5013C, um, will it be in competition with our EDC? Uh, will, it, will they be in competition with grants and things of that nature? And I know that was a concern down the road. Uh, so we do need to if we proceed with this, we do need to work together as a team uh, and, and work together as a community on that. But that's just one of the things, one of the questions I had uh, down the road with this. But uh, yeah, I certainly agree. We're not ready to make any kind of motion, any kind of vote or anything like that. And as Commissioner uh, Gentry said, uh, the private sector, if they want to start, somebody wants to start a private sector, go uh, start up funding. Um, you know, it's not through the county, it's, it's on them if they want to do that, and they can certainly do that. Uh, but that would be my concern is competition if they if there is a private sector 
and we're not working with it as a county or EDC, will that be competition? So anyway, I just wanted to say that and I appreciate all the efforts uh, that were made in putting this report together. I appreciate your, your comments very much. And I would just like to add, I don't think competition is a bad thing. That's your opinion. Chairman Powell. Yes, sir. Commission Palmer. Um, I would like to follow up where we were Wednesday in regards to this EDC task force meeting that we had right here in our temporary chambers. Um, I'm going verbatim off the top of my head for part of this now. So um, I started out with, I grew up here, was born, bred, raised, worked, raised five children here. I remember the day that Roxborough was packed six days a week, all day long, no parking, parking meters. Uh, every storefront was packed, just full of you name business that was there. So that being said, I would like to put my own two cents worth here in. Um, I know that the consensus here today amongst us all is to, to provide growth economically. And by advancing industrial development here generates jobs. Jobs create many avenues for growth. Jobs plus growth, growth create a stronger tax base for Person County and the state of North Carolina. I cannot thank the task force for the time that they put into working for free to help all departments within this county to promote growth for us all. That's it. Any other comments? Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir, please. Last week, <clears throat> I was um, reached out to two members of task force. They reached out to me and uh, met with them along with yourself um, for about two hours. And it was a very productive meeting, um, very positive. Um, we went over the concept. They answered the questions that, that I had. And one of the first things that was mentioned regarding how to get this concept to work is teamwork, a buy-in from all the private entities to come up to embrace this concept, research it, and come up with a model that will fit this county. This kind of reminds me of, of a concept back in 2007, it was called the Board of Boards. Some of you may uh, remember that concept, but it's also a, a model, not saying that that model would work, but it's something that the, uh, that the chamber, TDA, Uptown, if they so desire, um, can, can look at. I, I agree with the concept. I, it's just a matter of the approach and, and getting the buy-in. And if they have done the research and if they have um, established um, a private entity and want to move forward with it, I'm all on board with meeting them halfway on the, on the public side to what, um, to what can be accomplished. But I agree with Commissioner Gentry, Commissioner Sims, everybody about it's in, at this point, there is no motion, there's no recommendation. All we can recommend is for them to contact those task force members if they have any questions. I know a couple of them so that they would be goodwill ambassadors to um, if, um, to meet with them to find out what, uh, you know, if they had any uh, questions or share their notes like they did me, I promise you, it would be worth your while to reach out and sit down and talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. And after the fact, if you find out that this is something that you can, we can work together in our private community as one as, as a whole, I don't have a problem with once that's been established, coming back to our board and we go to the next phase of this. 
I'd like to say as well, I have spoken with four of the task force members, didn't get with the fifth uh, uh, individually. And uh, I echo what was just said and agree. Uh, they, they've done their homework. Uh, they put a lot of time and effort uh, into their task. And uh, I certainly appreciate that. Uh, as we continue these discussions, uh, I have no problem with the, the formation of um, a public private. In fact, I think it's very good. I think, however, we could go back and look at something uh, EDC did about maybe three, two to three years ago, and we were in the process of uh, developing a 501c3. We went so far as to have uh, a draft of bylaws for uh, a separate entity uh, drawn up, and we looked at the surrounding community as far as members that may be on a uh, nonprofit. Uh, so we did a lot of work, put a lot of time in there, and then a couple of things came along and uh, interrupted that process. But uh, I see it blending very well with what has already been said from task force members, and uh, I think it would behoove us all to move forward uh, with that process um, to develop either a total independent nonprofit or a combination public-private. Uh, certainly don't have any problem with it. So that's what I want to hear today are suggested next steps. And that could come from uh, certainly Commissioner Gentry or any other uh, board member. So we there's a lot of time and effort been put into it. Uh, so we don't want this to just uh, gather dust on the shelf, so to speak. So I want to move along with this process. Any suggestions or recommendations? I mean. As I stated before, this is in the, in the private sector's hands. It's in their ballpark, always has been. It did, is going to be yet to be determined who's going to take up the mantle and run with it. Yep. No, I, I think you know where there's no rec, there's no motion, there's no recommendation. We we've, we've heard, we and we gather input, and the public has heard, and we move on to the next item, Mr. Chairman. Any other comments? No one. Okay. Okay, uh, new business I, item number four, Tourism Development Authority Annual Report 2020-21. Martin Spencer. Good morning, Good morning. Um, to all of you. It's nice to see you guys today. Um, we're happy to be here today. Obviously, I'm representing the TDA to share our progress and our successes and also our reflections in regards to the 2020, the 2021 fiscal year. Our fiscal year, for those of you who are unfamiliar, runs from July, July 1 of that year through the end of June of the following year. Um, data shared today is consolidated reporting from the US Census Bureau, the economic impact of travel on North Carolina counties created for Visit North Carolina by Tourism Economics. Tourism Economics, is that's the company, Use survey data from OmniTrack, Travel Track America, the US Census Bureau, Bureau of Economics Analysis, and Bureau of Labor Statistics in conjunction with STR, AirDNA, and key data, the Federal Highway Administration, and US Energy Information Administration, as well as tax collections. These sources were combined into the travel economic impact model from the US Travel Association. If you guys have further questions about the source of the information shared today, please let me know and I can direct you to those resources um, as well as more information regarding that model. So the way I'm approaching this presentation as well is the annual report um, summarizes everything that I'd like to share with y'all. So I'm adding extra additional context um, and welcoming any questions regarding the annual report. And for those of us, uh, for those of y'all who are members of the public who are interested in what the TDA does um, in our annual report. It is available in the board packet, as well as you can work with us directly and we'll ha be happy to share that information um, with the public as well. So our budget this year, we began with a projected $195,500. Um, 
This was a modest projection based on anticipation of a downturn because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Tourism promotion, including administrative and operational expenses, accounted for 79%, with tourism-related accounting for 11% of our budget. We are classified as part of the North Central Region, according to the Economic Impact Reports. And the, our North Central Region, which includes some larger counties, um, experienced the largest decrease in total room revenues at a total of 51%. The least impacted this year were the Northwest, Southeast, and Northeast regions of the state of North Carolina. There were many factors as to how each region were in, was impacted, including but not limited to an increase or decrease in available lodging options, the halt of a particular travel market, for example, some of our larger urban communities experienced a decrease in business travel that a destination was dependent on, how each county chose to handle travel restrictions, and availability of outdoor and socially distanced activities, which we were lucky to have many of. The travel industry tracked public perception of the pandemic throughout the year, and overall we saw a shift in travel patterns, as you could expect, to more rural communities like ours that provide more opportunity for space and outdoor recreation. Um, as a side note, they continue to track those, and we are also continuing to track them um, because this year was a uh, not able to be compared to other years. So we're gonna see how this year goes as well coming out of the pandemic. Overall, we projected 195,500 in collections and received 308,000 approximately. So our net collections were approximately $298,000 in total. In regards to our lodging, we witnessed a sharp increase of collections relative to an increase in independent lodging options made available through rental platforms like Airbnb. This was one of the factors in our ability to make it positively through the pandemic in regards to our overall budget and collections. Rental platforms accounted for almost $90,000 of our income. So we are tracking that progress this year, as I said, to see any changes that may occur. Travel patterns continue to pivot in response to less restrictions and other factors. In regards to our economic impact, we are ranked 75th in total visitor spending. We saw only a decrease of 16% in visitor spending while the state of North Carolina saw roughly, I think, 32%. I didn't write that number down, but it's in the packet. Um, overall, we saved our residents an estimated $71.80 per resident, which is competitive with other counties. We saved more per resident than Chatham, Franklin, Graham, and Harnett counties, and only provided $7 less per resident than Orange County. And those are the counties that also are in our region um, in regards to that economic impact report. Our total savings per resident is $1, $1 less than Alamance County and is able, is able to provide based on their visitor spending. This estimate goes hand in hand with the type of market we are striving for. We have the luxury of not being a tourism dependent market. Our market and revenues exist to supplement the quality of life for our community while continuing to support the demand for travel to our destination, as well as the quality of experience in our destination. Quality or success is not defined by abundance in a destination community like ours. We strive for a quality market made up of naturally available experiences provided by our entrepreneurs. And we strive for an organic experience and presence of tourism that flow with as opposed to disrupting the day-to-day -day of our community. So bringing that full circle from a tourism standpoint, we are striving to maintain the essence of Person County with everything we do while achieving growth in a way that is proportionate to the needs and landscape of our residents. We are currently able to competitively and proportionately create a positive impact, economic impact, and that is our goal moving forward. So what did we do this year? Um, without listing everything off that's in the packet, I'd like to highlight a few major um, projects and things that we were able to achieve. Um, we worked with Parks and Rec as well as a large number of, and I list them all, but I don't want to leave someone out, of organizations to prepare for Cycle NC all year, um, which is the mountains to coast ride that came to Huck Sandsbury on October 5th. Um, we worked to increase our information distribution. Uh, we provided informational support as a local entity at the triathlon organized by uh, Kinetic Multisports at the uh, um, Heiko Lake Parking Campground. Um, that Parks and Rec also helped organize. We also provided a support, supportive participation through volunteering and funding um, through our Person County Tourism Built Northward Grant Program um, and supported those events that occurred in the area. 
Um, we have also received, we applied for and received through the CARES Act, increased funding to use for our digital and print marketing. Um, and we've also seen our community featured through free and paid opportunities on outlets, including Our State, Tar Heel Traveler, Garden and Gun Magazine. And we also have uh, materials that are consistently, consistently flying off the shelves at the RDU International Airport. So additionally to those things, um, we continue to advocate for community. We try to serve as a information source for not just visitors, but our new residents, which we get many of coming in there into our visitor center, um, as well as our locals who are looking for more information. We are working on our social media and have seen an increase in per public perception of our social media um, to help again, advocate for the beauty of the area, as well as provide kind of a log of resources and advocacy for our programs, events, and activities that are available naturally in the area. And the last thing that we are working on is updating, well, that's coming up, I'll, looking ahead. <laughs> uh, looking ahead, like coming into this next fiscal year, the fiscal year we're currently in that started in July, um, we are looking at updating our uh, branding, which is more of a visual representation of our county without rebranding it. Um, we're looking at uh, we're in the process of wayfinding signage implementation. We have a community map brochure in the works, a road map. So a navigational road map is um, on the way, as well as an outdoor pamphlet and map display at the visitor center and increased gift shop options at the visitor center as well. Um, and with our gift shop, we're seeking to fill a gap in the community. We're not serving to, we're not looking to compete with our local businesses. Um, we're looking to provide more um, person county spirit wear, if you will, uh, for our local community members that otherwise can't find it at other businesses. So that, those are the things we're looking at moving forward, um, as well as some other things, but those are our key ones. So as I close my remarks and, and open up for questions, um, we'd like to thank all of our partnering organizations this year. Um, I'd like to go ahead and just list them off from my report. Um, The Person County Board of Commissioners, the Person County Economic Development Department, Person County of Arts, Parks and Recreation, the Roxborough City Council, Uptown Roxborough Group, Roxborough Area Chamber of Commerce, and all of our local hospitality businesses and partners. Um, without you guys, we would not be able to do what we do on a daily basis. And this past year would not have been possible without the quality of leadership and communication that occurred consistently between organizations to keep our community moving forward during a difficult time. We are able to, just to summarize, we were able to provide approximately $6,700 in grant funds to our local organizations. That is lower than our normal provided each year um, due to the lack of events that were occurring. So we are looking forward to reporting next year around this time that we will be able to fulfill our anticipated budget, which is much, much higher than that um, in terms of contributing to our organizations. And I'd like to close with what I wrote in my report because I feel like it summarizes it summarizes it best. Um, let me get that last page. Here it is. So we're going to continue our grant program as well as resume our annual tourism summit, which serves as a a collaboration between organization leaders to align all of our plans between tourism, economic development, et cetera. But our goals moving forward are grounded with our intention to continue our support of local organizations and their efforts to engage the community, provide for the community and grow the community. It is our existing and future collaboration with these organizations, as well as our tourism partners and community members that will aid the growth of the relationship between tourism and this community together achieving our vision. Um, so thank you guys again for the time to speak today and share what tourism has been working on. If you have any questions, please let me know. Questions, anyone? Oh. Chairman, I always like when you look directly at me, like, oh, here she goes again. No, no I just want to make sure everyone has the opportunity to speak. <laughs> I know. Uh, just real quickly, what, what's your engagement, your community engagement with your like your websites, your Facebook, what's what's the, what's the level of participation that the community has accessing contact with you? Okay, um, so we are open. I'm just going to run down the list. I guess our visitor center is open nine to five during the week um, with full coverage. We're working towards being open on Saturdays, um, but that's going to take increased implementation of administrative procedures to be able to address that because um, we've heard that from the public that people would like that. 
um, our website and is in our plan. Currently, um, we are not satisfied with the level of traffic on our website. Uh, we do see an increase. So I don't have exact numbers for you with the website, but I can provide them based on our Google Analytics. Um, but with the level of traffic on our website right now, we see an increase when we post blogs, um, but our website's currently lacking in sufficient, in my opinion, sufficient information regarding a lot of our assets in the community. So we're looking to increase those. And the only reason we haven't since I've been here provided any kind of SEO or, or engaged in any kind of SEO or SEM campaign um, or increased marketing is because we want to make sure those dollars count. And so we're waiting until we can implement further information on our website to be able to bring it full circle and um, further market target marketing. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, to increase the traffic, because those are these systems that would increase the traffic to our website. Um, so we are waiting to implement that in this coming through the remainder of this year into, into the next fiscal year. Our social media we've seen um, go up, I'm trying to remember what the percentage is. We have, I set pretty high expectations for this year's increase um, and we'll have reporting on that at the end. Um, but where we've started at, we're seeing immense engagement online specifically regarding our uh, event upcoming events calendar, which we're working on like, getting the kinks out of so we can make sure everybody's informed. Um, and you know, we're at about, I think, 1700 sounds like a lot, I think, but we're, we're in the 11 something range mm -hmm. on social media for Facebook. We've seen a bigger, um, a bigger reaction to Facebook than Instagram. Um, so that kind of covers, I think all of our digital avenues. Were there any that you specifically had? Would, would you have a Twitter account as well? We have one, but I have not engaged on it as actively. I'm looking to I think do that in the near future to engage with economic developments, Twitter as well, and to further their sharing. Um, I have not quite pinpointed who are, who our target audience is for Twitter yet, yeah. because a large, um, a large portion of our audience for, or a large portion of our target market for who's coming to Person County are mainly Facebook users. Exactly. Um, and I don't, I don't think Twitter is the best outlet. I haven't seen a large following on Twitter <coughs> by any d department here in the county. I mean, there's like 200 or less on, I mean, that really yeah. doesn't make a significant impact. So I was just curious if you were using it because mm -hmm. I don't know that it's impact. In communities like Durham, um, Discover Durham has a wonderful sense of humor and they also have a lower um, at median age for who's visiting their area. And so they're able to implement Twitter in a way that's modern mm -hmm. <laughs> and that refl reflects the humor on Twitter, um, but we just haven't gotten there yet. So maybe if we see an increase, but yes. Okay, Ms. Spencer, thank you very much. Thank you for what you're doing in person, Danny. For thank you, Molly. Appreciate it. Uh, new on the job, but doing a good job. We well, thank you. Thank you. And I love it here. And it is very much a privilege to be a personian now. So I hope everybody who's been here a long time knows that. So. And Marley makes a great stew too. I'm sorry. You make a great stew too, right? Absolutely. JC is best in the county. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Right. Mr. Chairman, may I ask that we take a yeah. five minute recess? I'm sorry. May we, may I make a, a, a request that we have a five minute recess, please? Yes. Yes. Madam Clerk, would you remind us we're at five minutes up, please? Sure. <laughs> Thank you.
Oh, it right. back to order, please. You're right. I cut the heat off. <laughs> it is cold in here. These chairs are cold. <laughs> Hey, I need a cushion. Where is Sims? Sims. Go ahead and tell him to start. Let's get Mr. Started. Sims. Call ourselves back to order here, please. Item number five on our agenda is my health update. Ms. Kathy. Good morning. As you know, Person County is in the process of transitioning mental health services from Cardinal Innovations to Via Health. And this morning, um, Brian Ingram, President and CEO of Via Health, is here to provide you with an update on that transition. He does have a presentation and will speak to the board. Um, and following that, there will be an action item as he covers in his presentation. The board will have the opportunity to appoint two representatives to one of VIA's regional boards. So you'll get some more information about that during his presentation as well. So I'd like to welcome him this morning. Um, turn it over. Thank you. And I'll say I appreciate your willingness to stay with us uh, this morning. Sorry to. <laughs> Great education. That's how we learn about communities. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ryan. Yeah. Uh, Brian Ingram, CEO at Via Health. And we are about to become your LME MCL. And I bet there'd be a lot of trouble passing a quiz this morning about what an LME MCO is, right? So let's start with the with the basics. Uh, local management entity managed care organization, okay? So in, in all states, there are systems that are created by government that are responsible for uh, directly or indirectly the care of individuals that have mental illness, substance use, and intellectual and developmental disabilities. And, and really there's two main streams of funding that address that the, the needs for care. Uh, the first of which is Medicaid, which is by far the biggest. Um, so the MCO part of our name stands for Managed Care Organization. So we have a very substantial contract with North Carolina to manage the Medicaid funds for individuals who need care for mental illness, substance use, intellectual developmental disabilities. So we do not provide the care directly. We're essentially a public insurance company. And the good part about that is what we care about is simply the greatest benefit for an individual. You know, we don't have to create profit uh, for, for shareholders. Um, it's really about service. The LME part of it goes to really the heart of a big debate in North Carolina. And I think there's now 13 states that have not expanded uh, Medicaid. And regardless of, of what your position is you know, with that, there are a number of individuals who do not qualify for Medicaid who need help for problems with mental illness, substance use, IDD. So we are also funded at a much, much, much lower amount of money to manage the care for those individuals. And one really important distinction is, you know, remember Medicaid is an entitlement that's means tested. In other words, it's based on income, family size, you either qualify or you don't. <clears throat> and if you do qualify, you are entitled to care. It's a federal program that all the states participate in. I know you're pretty familiar with it. Um, the, the challenge is while you are eligible and entitled to care, it's not about having all the care that there is, right? It's about getting the right amount at the right time that you're going to receive the most benefit for. So that's the piece of it that we do. Essentially the same thing for the non-Medicaid population, although it's much, much, much more difficult because there's the ratio of funding to individuals that need care is so out of whack. And, um, you know, that, that's really if our, our biggest challenge is meeting the needs of those individuals. So, as you were told, you're in the process of dealing with a consolidation. Okay, now what is that all about? 
right after Memorial Day, Cardinal, which is another LME MCL, and there's six of them in the state, decided that it would be better for them to merge with Via Health and to continue on. And they were in a situation and, and your uh, chairperson's a member of, of the board there and, and he could explain it probably even better than I could. They had decided that it would be better for them to consolidate with Via than continue on. There's a lot of conflict with counties, leaving, not knowing what they wanted to do and really in the service of providing a clear path for the future, they worked with us uh, to agree to a consolidation. Uh, VIA will be the uh, continuing entity, okay? We'll be the organization that's left after the consolidation. Cardinal will dissolve at some point next year. Um, part of what I'll, I'll talk to you about today is all that's involved with that and how that impacts person county in terms of governance and the pace of all of that. But in broad strokes, that consolidation part of it should be complete about January 1st. So we're here now in, in preparation for that. And uh, I mean, we've been here a few times. This is my second time here. Haven't been able to meet all of you. So I'm happy to be able to do that. Um, really just explain a little bit about what's going on with that consolidation. You know, what are some of the things we're working on in the community? How well do we do what we do anyway, right? Um, and then a little bit about what you can expect into the future. So, you know, this, just because I think this is what's important on the slides, please, you, this is at your service. So you ask questions about things that I may not explain well or, or you have interest in learning more about. And uh, we'll kind of go at, at your pace here with things. Hopefully, these are the, the same words that you'll use as you come to know us that reflect how we work with members and with communities and really just, uh, I'll say, our, our style and our approach. Proximity, um, you know, in a lot of the counties that are new to us in the eastern part of the state, you know, have asked, well, how can you do what you do? You know, you're all over in the west. It doesn't make any difference to us you'll have the same things here that all the counties in other parts of the state that we work with have. Uh, the people that will work with your citizens will live here. Uh, they'll work here. Um, they'll be part of the community just as it is in, in all the other counties. Um, accountability, I mean, it's simple. You know, we have to do what we say we're going to do. And that's the expectation you should have from us. And you'll always be given, I think, good status on a lot of that as we go along. And collaboration, <clears throat> you know, the only way we are going to be successful is to work closely with all of you and, and many of your departments. Um, DSS, you know, tends to be the one that we have the biggest interface with. And in fact, in the packet, there's a whole kind of almost encyclopedia that we provide to DSSs that talks about how we um, interface around a whole variety of, of things that involve members. And stability, um, you know, we're in the middle of Medicaid transformation. And again, whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing, it's a big thing. Um, you know, we've seen the, the go live of the standard plans, which is you know, Medicaid managed care for the broad population of, of North Carolina that went live July 1st with private health plans as opposed to us, we're, we're public. And by next year, sometime, um, July or so, there will be what are called tailored plans, which will be very specially designed plans for individuals with very chronic and comorbid conditions. A lot of the folks that we work with um, that have additional complicated health issues um, we only manage now the, what we call the specialty care for those populations, um, for those uh, disability areas. In the future as a tailored plan, we will also manage all of the physical health benefits, including pharmacy, but for a very distilled, again, you know, very chronic population. So that's the next evolution in, in Medicaid transformation that'll 
occur uh, next year. Boy, this map changed a lot in the last year um, with the dissolution or the planned dissolution of Cardinal, you know, counties went in a lot of different directions. And um, it's very disruptive uh, all, all across the board for members, for providers, for our organizations, for the LME MCOs, for the state. It's good that things have settled down now and the final choices have been made. So you can see the dark blue there is VIA, and that's if you count them up, 31 counties, which is a lot of real estate. Um, the uh, challenge of engaging counties and, and them choosing which LME MCO to be part of has it's a double-edged sword because that change takes on enormous consequences and results in a lot of volatility. Uh, the secretary has said, you know, no more changes. You know, everybody has gone wherever they want to go and they won't entertain any requests around change from LME MCOs until a year after the tailored plans go live, which is expected to be July 1st of next year. You know, which, it, you know, everybody just really needs to take a breath and get settled down. Um, and work on things. And, and that's a lot of what we'll be talking about here. So that's what we have to look forward to for the near future. Super measures. So the, the Department of Health and Human Services has some broad contract performance requirements. So, you know, you might wonder, well, how, do you, how well do you do what you do? Well, we do very well. Um, it remains to be seen if we'll be able to continue to do that well because what you'll see is that some of the performance of Cardinal has been uh, much less than, than ours. Um, so, you know, part of the process of taking on these new nine counties is, is bringing those standards up. Um, follow up after discharge from inpatient facilities, of course, that's when people are most vulnerable. If you think about it, it's such a high level of care, you wanna be sure they're contacted and ready for um, community-based care, do very well with that. Transitions to community living. And this really reflects, I think, uh, something about our philosophy anyway, in terms of helping people live in the least restrictive environment, is how I would put it. Um, you know, it's what we would, should want for everyone, right? Um, so the, the state has evolved in a direction where in fact, this is a settlement with the Department of Justice. Um, the state allowed too many people to be put in community residential programs rather than in um, more freestanding apartments and, and residences. So we're, as an agent of the state, required to help those people move out of those community, less community-based organizations and more into the community, just like you and I. We do very, very well with that. And then integrated care for um, individuals with developmental disabilities. Things as simple as, do you have a primary care physician? You know, have you been in the last year? You know, we take some of these things for granted, um, but one of the things that we know for individuals uh, that we work with, many of them don't have primary care physicians, much less go regularly. So there's some real basic things that we have to get in order. And you see the graph there, non-Medicaid members serve. That's uh, penetration is a very, very important metric. Simply put, if you take money and you say you've got this much money and we're gonna create a ratio between how much money you get and how many people are served, you look where VIA is, okay? We're always first or if not first, real close to first in the state continually for the last couple of years. You see a you know, very, very significant difference with Cardinal. So again, will we be able to maintain that high level? Not at first, but our goal will be to bring it up to that level as soon as we can. And I'm sorry, that was for non-Medicaid members. And again, what I explained, that is the most challenging aspect of the care that we manage because of the big discrepancy between need and funding. 
but yet you should be very happy for your members. And we're very proud of this, uh, that despite those challenges, we do the best of, of anyone in the state. <coughs> Call this the report card, which is real simple. You look for green, yellow, or red. So for VIA, you see green across the board, right? And again, for Cardinal, you see some, some red and some yellow. So we will be doing our best to improve on those metrics uh, just as quickly as, as we can. Um, same, uh, same criteria we discussed earlier on the, on the slide proceeding. This really you know, talks uh, in part about the relationship that we have with communities and especially um, it's called the CFAC, Consumer and Family Advisory Council. There'll be four representatives from the CFAC on our new board. And I'll talk a little bit more about the board here in a minute. But the CFAC um, is required in statute, but you know, it doesn't have to be a requirement for us to have a lot of respect and collaboration. And it's very important for us to be in touch with the members that we serve. Uh, the CFACs are just what they sound like. Consumer Family Advisory Council um, work very closely with us. They're in the same process as the county commissioners now in terms of creating a regional structure so that they can have representation across the four regions that we've established and then recommend uh, their membership to our governing board. So as I said, January 1st, and this is this date's changed quite a bit. Um, and to just be honest with you, it's been very, very difficult for Cardinal to maintain their staff so that uh, the consolidation date is really uh, a compromise between how soon we can be ready to do everything and how long Cardinal can keep the lights on. Um, because as soon as you know, the, the idea of consolidation, you know, got out there, it's competition for counties, the other LME MCOs, it's very destabilizing to a workforce. You know, we, this is the fourth time we've done this and they have not all been the same. This one is, I would say the most complicated. Um, you know, all the others have been just as, I, I just say seamless. And that's our, our standard, that's our goal. So that for an individual receiving care that we manage, they would not really know anything is any different. They would eventually see that things had improved, but there wouldn't be any interruption in their care. Um, same thing for providers. Now there may have to be some things that we do to help manage uh, the claims processing aspect behind, behind the scenes type things. But again, no disruption in authorizations, payments, you know, nothing like that. And, you know, again, uh, all the contracts that are in place with providers automatically um, are transferred to VIA. And, um, you know, all the best staff from Cardinal as well. So far, we've hired, I think, a little bit north of 330 staff. So it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of work. Governance. This is something that came up a lot when we were out talking with counties and thinking really in the joint steering committee that was put together from the Cardinal board and from the VIA board to oversee the, the consolidation. So probably one of our biggest discussion topics. You know, how are we going to create a, a board that would uh, be properly informed by counties? Uh, how can counties have a voice? Because we have a large number of county commissioners, DSS directors, you know, on our board as it is now. So one of the challenges associated with consolidation was that we had to create a new board of directors. And with that, uh, in absorbing the, the new nine counties, reorganize the way we have our county commissioner advisory board. So if I just kind of hit the milestones, um, you know, a lot of those discussions in, in counties when we were out meeting them seemed to uh, come up with a, a regional approach. 
It's similar to what um, one of our colleagues in the, in the East uses that would allow for representatives from each county to be part of that regional board. And again, based on the geography, four regions made sense. They tend to be the counties that would that historically most work together. Um, and then a, a process by which counties, boards of commissioners, and this is next on your agenda, would appoint members to that regional board. So two members for each county to the regional board. And then those four regions establish members directly to our board of directors. So four regions, uh, two representatives per region that are on the, on the governing board. So we've been in a real hurry up phase. First of all, we had to ask for um, permission for an alternative board structure for the sec from the secretary. And we were granted that. See the, the law, the statute never anticipated all of this, right? Um, you know, large catchment areas and, and the diversity that we have now. And the general statute hasn't anticipated a lot of things. And, and honestly, it's a, it's a challenge to operate with that. But in this case, uh, there was a provision that allowed for us to petition the secretary to do things a little differently. And we were granted that. So that regional board status is what we're um, evolving to right now with all of your cooperation. And I know some of the counties uh, like yours are, you know, are making those selections. There's another meeting of all of the uh, counties first week or so in December, I think. And Chairman Powell and, and Heidi, you were, were you on our call? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So that's uh, coming up in a couple of weeks to just kind of check the status. What we'll need to do is get those regional boards up and running just as soon as they can and then facilitate them making their choices for the governing board. Because we need to have the, the I guess we'll call it the VIA 2.0 board uh, seated by, I mean, ideally by January, but it'll probably take till February. Um, there'll be some at-large members also that are added in after the, the regional boards make their, their choices. A lot going on in preparation of, of January 1st. Um, you know, and I'm not going to try to go over all of these things, um, but been very diligent in terms of working with, you know, primarily DSS, um, a lot of a lot of work on um, children's services, placements for youth, um, crisis services. That tends to be the the majority of the development that we're um, seeing as being needed most urgently. Um, establishing greater access to care uh, generally, and we have models that are in place that are very successful with that. And you saw that by the metrics. It's just a matter of how quickly we can bring some of those things up here in, in person in other counties. And we'll be giving you progress reports on that all the time. In fact, in your packet, and I should have mentioned this, there's, yeah, this is Children and Youth Services Resource Guide. And again, this is really, the audience for this is DSS because it's just, it's, there's so much interface there. We want to make it as simple as possible. So it's kind of like a little how-to guide. Uh, this one pager. So we do one of these for each one of our counties. Of course, we can't yet because we don't have all the data. Um, but you'll be getting a, a one-page newsletter that's you know specific to your county every, every month. Um, so a lot of reporting, a lot of just transparency. It's no kind of us and them thing. Um, you know, we want to do the best job we possibly can and, you know, move as quickly as we can to make the improvements that we, we see are uh, in the interest of your, of your citizens, um, but pick the right pace around that. <clears throat> DJJ, yeah, juvenile justice, it's, it's kind of the, the kissing cousin of all of this. Um, so much is, is focused on kids and kids services. And I can tell you if there's one area where, you know, we've seen a tremendous impact by COVID, it's for youth. Um, certainly it's there for adults, but youth, 
um, and it's not over yet. The, the volume of youth in DSS custody needing higher levels of care and often um, very high levels of care for just incredibly complicated problems. You know, we might see a, a case like that, um, you know, once every couple of months. Now it's, it's like once every week or two that are just uh, baffling. You know, there aren't even really services designed to meet the needs of, of a lot of these kids. Um, but we work very hard to create that and have some very unique relationships with providers where we're able to do that. The embedded um, care management at DSS, and I know Chairman Powell, we spoke to that. We had someone there, I think they left. I think they got recruited by another LME MCO. So we're refilling that position now. Um, the single point of assessment at DSS, um, just very practical things um, that you know, we've been doing for a long time. And it's kind of interesting to find other areas where you know, that hasn't been the case. Kids need assessments, you know, why not bring the, the clinician rate to DSS? Don't stress out the family and the kid any more than necessary. You know, make it easy on people. And that assessment is really critical to figuring out the path forward. Yeah, and same thing on, you know, the state run facilities um, for individuals with developmental disabilities. Yeah, we've just always been thinking about how people can be maintained in the community. And not because we don't want people to have the best care, but that the best care for someone isn't in an institution. It can be in the, in the community to have the right services. It's just sort of a long-term you know, approach that we have. And again, you know, we're, we're way out front with that. And then you see the people to get a hold of. Um, you know, my card's in your packet. Brian Chuping, hopefully he's a familiar face. I know Elliot would have been here this morning, but he's a little under the weather. He's worked with you for some time. Um, call us, email us. You know, their job especially is to be engaged at whatever level is needed to make things work. Pretty simple. So be happy to uh, stop there or answer any questions you have. And I appreciate the break. That was good to get a little fresh air here before I started. Any, any questions, comments to Ms. Ingram? Go Why do you always look to me first, huh? <laughs> Ladies first. Being polite. Yep. Brian, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. The two Brian's. Yeah. yeah well, Brian and Brian. Yeah, Brian and Brian. Uh, yeah, we were easy to remember. Uh, certainly, I look forward to working with, uh, with you folks in Bio and with my experiences with Cardinal over the past several years with, uh, with their board of directors. Uh, this is an incredibly complex mm -hmm. service to our community. Mm -hmm. That's where I am, local, right here. And I've expressed that all along. When you're in a boardroom that has a billion dollar budget, sometimes local can get left out. And uh, that's, that's my thing, always has been, and you're well aware of my feelings there. And I appreciate your efforts to put someone in DSS because that's where it's happening. Sure. And, and we need to provide those services. Uh, it's easy for us to go about our daily routine when we, we're healthy. Uh, sometimes I wonder about my mental state, uh, no pun intended, but uh, seriously, those that can't help themselves is what this is all about. And, uh, and we do have those in our community. And I think that's one of the greatest callings that we would have as a society, as well as a board of directors, a board of commissioners here, along with you folks. So I look forward to the future. Uh, I will say, and Manager York might add a comment or two here, uh, we did have options of who to go with, uh, with um, the dissolution of um, Cardinal. And um, bias seemed to be a good fit because of its rural nature. Mm -hmm. Smaller counties, few people, because in the, the group that I was with, our counties, 
850,000 people yeah. that needed the services of um, a Cardinal. And uh, so it was, it was a huge organization. So this again, seemed to be a good fit for Person County and I uh, look forward to working with you. Appreciate your availability and, and um, being with us in Person County. I, Manager York, any comment? No, thank you for being here. We're excited about the partnership. We're looking forward to, to working together. So great. They've done a great job with outreach to us, making themselves available. We've committed to some goals and improvements that we'd like to see uh, working with them. So we're anxious to make some forward motion on those. Oh, we'll be back whenever you want. <clears throat> You'll get tired of us probably. Uh, we won't Thank do that. Yeah. Appreciate your time. Sorry that you had to get in on a meeting that uh, was a little lengthy, but maybe you'll have time for lunch between here and your next appointment. I think we're running down to uh, chat on here this Chatting afternoon next. for a work session. Yeah. So. Okay. Right. Yeah. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you so for coming. Very much. Thanks. I have a Appreciate question, yeah, Gordon. Sure. Thank, you for, thank you for being such an integral part of the Cardinal innovation work group. I know you've spent a lot of time, a lot of hours on those meetings. So my question is, we're adding services that we don't currently have with Cardinal to like our DSS. We're adding medical services and mental health, medical services that we haven't had before. We're hoping to enhance services. They've okay. always been available. We've just not Mm -hmm. had the opportunity to engage in those. So one of the okay, examples so we're actually is- going to use them this time? <laughs> well, it's not a matter of us using them or not. We wanted somebody on site to assist our caseworkers, to assist our law enforcement um, and our health employees when they encounter uh, cases that need assessment or whatnot. Right, and, and this so is a medical professional? Yes, and let me- distinguish here we will not be re responsible for physical health mm -hmm. management right. until next year and okay. probably july plus so right now it's specific to behavioral health and services and supports for uh, idd and a lot of it as heidi's saying it's a, you have to have a continuum in place and you know what we're finding is you might have a, a this this and that but you know we've got to fill in some of the gaps mm -hmm. and really it's just very you know relatively simple things like access you know having that and it's a very uh you know well-trained clinician doing these assessments uh, as part of youth villages and, and the beauty of that is they're independent you know they're not also in the business of then saying oh well john or mary I'm going to shade this evaluation this way so you'll come to us, right? Mm -hmm. See, they're not one of the residential providers here. Gotcha. So they're giving you a clean view of, of the kid independent. Cool. Okay. And then I have one, one quick question. Establishment of a comprehensive care center within the county. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> a great question. This is something we started I've been there 11 years and we started really, you know, when I came because it's how you approach care in a rural county, <clears throat> okay? And, you know, you've got choice and you have quality and you have access, right? How do you balance all of those? You can't have in a rural county services that are not clinically and financially viable. So we can't have multiple providers sometimes doing the same level of care when there's not going to be enough service demand for everybody to make it. It's just the truth. It, this is healthcare. You know, it's the same all the way around. You know, you, you see this everywhere. So what we've designed are, it's kind of like the Alamo, you know, organizations that tend to be, I'll say, larger, okay, that can manage uh, whatever we throw at them. So in other words, they're going to be, if they, if they get that designation, they're going to have to be responsible for walk-in care. Um, so someone comes in off the street, gets an assessment, access to medical core, which essentially is going to be a psychiatrist or medication for medication management, um, crisis intervention, or ongoing treatment. And that sounds pretty basic and pretty simple, but until you say, we're gonna have all of that under one roof, 
it tends to be very dispersed and inefficient and mm -hmm. people don't get access to it in the way that we like. That's why we, that's why that metric that I showed you, why we score so high, because people know where to go. And we have a provider that can sustain that level of care. And then they're well suited to do other things like mobile crisis, because they already have that infrastructure to deal with an individual in crisis. It might be that same provider that does a facility-based crisis program. So it's about scale and packaging the right continuum of care into one provider under one roof. Because especially in the rural areas, can't sustain you know, a large volume of providers doing a lot of different things. It's hard to run the members too. Takes a while to get there. It's not gonna happen the first year, I take it. <laughs> it it'll, it'll work in progress? Yeah. yeah. Well, Cardinal officially, I think will be finished end of May. And so transitions are difficult. Yeah. But I uh, appreciate everyone's efforts in there to make it a smooth transition because uh, during that transition, we don't, look, don't want to lose sight of who we're serving. No, and, absolutely uh, not. Don't want to break down there, but thank you for all your efforts there. And thank you very much. You, appreciate your presence. Thank today. you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Item number six uh, on the agenda is appointment to Via Health Regional Board. Ms. Kathy. Okay, so the next item on your agenda is to appoint one or two representatives to the VIA Health Regional Board. The criteria for doing so is that one representative must be an elected county commissioner. If you would like to make an appointment for a second representative, which is optional, the criteria that must be met is the second person would be either a county commissioner, the county manager, Department of Social Services Director, Public Health Director, or Law Enforcement Representative. So the board is to discuss um, possible representatives and make appointments. Mr. Chair, yes. what, who was uh, previous to this? Uh, who, were you the only one that was on the board? Yes. So we didn't have a, another alternative or anything? I'm sorry? That, we didn't have an alternative. No, no, no it was just you. Okay. part of the structure. Prior to, and always, as Kathy stated, it's not a requirement, it's an option. Okay. Good. You, you could have one or you could have two. I don't know that you'd want. Did you see it? Did you see a need for one, an, another person, or not? Personally, I don't. Okay. Personal opinion. Uh, because fine. I think the, the uh, makeup will be structured a little different. We typically ran 19 to 21 members on the Cardinal board, and this is going to be for smaller groups. So I don't see necessarily see the need for it. Well, I would, I would like to make the recommendation if we can of you uh, serving on that board. That'd be my recommendation. Being represented from the county. Any other recommendations? What are the, the other choices if we wanted a secondary person would be law enforcement? Do you, I mean? Yes, so a second county commissioner, county manager, department of social services director, public health director, or a law enforcement representative. So how many, this is gonna be a regional thing. It's a new regional, it's gonna be smaller. So are other, other entities doing, adding more people than we, I mean, is there advantage on the weight Brian, side of that? Let me, let me try to help you. This, this is new. Okay, so mm -hmm. I appreciate your question about how it was done in the past, but this is, a, this is a little bit different. So again, this is specifically to address the County Commissioner Advisory Board uh, requirements and uh, ability for counties to interface with us. So on, on these regional boards, it's only, it has, to, it has to be one county commissioner, mm -hmm. okay? And then the second person is optional. It can be another county commissioner. It can be county manager. It can be, you know, all or those no. other positions. And or what no. we found, you know, when we went around, sometimes uh, the DSS commissioner or the public health commissioner is the person, you know, most engaged with this type of work. So we wanted to be sure to provide that option to counties 
Um, so this is specific to, you know, what Cardinal has had in the past and what we've had in the past, it's called the County Commissioner Advisory Board. So it's those four regional boards will make up that group in its entirety. Okay, so would our health board, someone from our health board be a logical person to enhance this? It's an option. In, in addition to the commissioner? So amend the motion for uh, Gordon Powell to be the primary county commission representative, Janet Clayton to be the secondary optional for representing the uh, health department. So we have a motion, any further discussion? Great idea. All in favor of the motion as stated, say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, motion carried. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank looking, you. Looking forward to working with you. Yeah, looking forward to working with you. Mm -hmm. Item number seven, an update on person industries and the uh, person county recycling center. Uh, Ms. Everett. Finally, we got to you, huh? <laughs> good morning, almost good afternoon, board. I am here today just to provide you an update on person industries and the recycling center per the request of Commissioner Gentry. Um, I have three items that I would like to discuss today in a memo that I provided you. The first one is in regards to the feasibility study that was approved for us to uh, conduct this year. We had an initial meeting with RRS uh, and that was held on the 27th of September. Uh, a person county data request was submitted on the 29th of October and that included demographics, needs of operations and facility um, details and materials that were needed. We had our first site visit with RRS this past Friday and we discussed different systems and equipment options as well as updates to the building that would not only be ADA accessible and sorting material in a more efficient manner. And this was also, he told us, a very feasible option that would be coming down the pipe for our recycling center, where at first we were looking at something along the lines of Machine X, which is like a multi-million dollar um, system that you can put in that includes a lot of automated sorting. This machine that he's looking into, they just uh, submitted one or put one in up in Wisconsin, and they also have one in New Jersey. Um, they mentioned that they would like for us to go and be able to look at one of those. I did inform him of the limits of travel of, that we have to be very careful with, but they showed us a video of it. And it's a very neat machine that would allow us to employ more of our individuals with disabilities because of the safety measures that it has and also the ability for the material. And it's, a, it's kind of a circle machine. So the material goes round and round where the individuals are able to pull that material a lot easier and we are not touching it as much because right now we're touching and going through the material anywhere between two and three times when it goes across the conveyor line. We are then running it back across the conveyor line just so we can get as many commodities out of that single stream material that we can because the more that we can sort down and the more that we can send out individualized commodities versus single stream or commingled material, the more money that we can bring in for the recycling center. <clears throat> um, the, let's see, we are scheduled to receive a memo update before Thanksgiving, and then we will have an equipment update by the end of the year from RSS. So we are fully on schedule with the feasibility study and it's going very well. There are two individuals, um, Matt Todd and Sherry Yarowski, uh, that, that came on Friday. Uh, it was a very detailed meeting that we had pretty much the majority of the day. Uh, where they went through and we discussed all the needs of the building. They walked through, saw what we currently have and what we also need to be able to move over from PI to get everything into one location. And again, that will just really help us in our scope of business of what we can do. An update for Person Industries, which is my second item on your memo, is we are finally returning to full operations in regards to the COVID-19 pandemic, and we are very excited about that. Um, one by one, our consumers have been trickling back in. They were very worried about um, safety protocols that we had in place. The Person County Group Homes will be returning within the next week or so. 
um, they were just waiting to receive their booster shots. And that um, happened on the 31st of October. So they were waiting for two weeks after the boosters for everything to get into their system, just because we wanna make sure that we're not causing any spread within the residential homes. We also, with the uh, assistance of Via Health, we are bringing in new consumers under our ADVP program service definition, and that is our adult developmental vocational program. And this definition has been on hold for five years with Cardinal. So we are very excited in the work that VIA is doing and how they are working with us. And this just gives us an opportunity to provide more services at the recycling center um, and in-house. So it's just a great opportunity to serve the individuals who've been on that wait list with Cardinal for many, many years. And just uh, going off of what the Brian had said about VIA, we are working diligently with VIA Health in regards to the merger and consolidation. Uh, we are very excited about the merger. The company uh, is very focused on individuals with developmental disabilities and being that that's who we serve, we have seen great support from VIA Health. There has been no lapse in coverage um, or authorizations, as he said, no denials when it comes to services. So we're very pleased with what we're seeing so far in regards to our partnership with VIA. And lastly, the update that I wanted to provide you was just some recycling challenges that we have been seeing throughout the county. And I had a couple of things that I wanted to set straight and I meant to grab my phone. Let me grab that real quick. I am aware that a few, well, I'm aware that was there was some information shared in regards to Clayton and Hurdle recycling. And I wanted to make sure that I really spoke about that today and let you all know the communication that has happened and the avenues that we have taken to really try to improve recycling and also improve our communication and our partnership with Clayton and Hurdle. And so technically communication really began over the past couple of years, we have really been on, on track of enhancing education and cleaning up our recycling. And the only way that you can do that is by the advertising and getting the information out there, making sure that our residents are very well informed of what is received at the recycling center. Well, beginning in July of this year, we were really focusing on getting the single stream and the commingled material cleaned up that were coming in from our residential recycling, and especially from the material that was picked up with um, our private haulers. And so the, the communication began in July. We continue to try to have communication with Clayton and Hurdle in regards to just, we really need to talk to you and we really need to get this material cleaned up. So uh, during that time, just to kind of let you know what was going on, our trash pickup, which is handled by General Services and the city of Roxborough that picks up our receptacles, um, went from three days a week to five days a week. And the reason that we know that this was due to Clayton Hurdle material is because we had designated a bunker space over at the recycling center specifically for Clayton and Hurdle dropping off their material. And we were looking at anywhere between a 60 and 70% contamination rate that was coming through from curbside pickup for recycling at Clayton and Hurdle. Now, please know that Clayton and Hurdle offers a recycling pickup. So their customers are paying additional money for them to pick up their recycling. So in my mind, if I'm paying extra for something, that means I'm gonna do it correctly. So all we wanted to do was to make sure that we were providing that information and that we got with Clayton and Hurdle and we were working with them to work with their customers to see what needed to take place. We tried to have a meeting um, and that was not successful. There was no interest in having a meeting for us to get this material straightened up. Every bit of communication that we had either over the phone um, was taken very negatively and we did not come at Clayton and Hurdle with any type of negative comments. Um, I believe that it was taken personally against them in regards to us saying that their material was contaminated. All we wanted was for them to communicate to their customers of what we needed to do. So an email was sent out by myself on October the 7th and it was um, addressed to Brock Hurdle. And it was just informing him that I had met with 
Rhonda Gentry and Michael Stevens, who are my assistant director and my pr production coordinator supervisor at the Recycling Center. And it spoke about how in the last two weeks, we had really seen a rise in the con contamination. It continued to rise and that uh, we were unable to sort through their material because I was unwilling to put the safety and health of my employees at risk because of the levels of contamination. And when I say levels of contamination, I participated in the solid waste um, sort that we had back in 2015. The audit, I think. We the audit, that. yes. I participated in that where I was dressed in a Tyvek suit from head to toe for three days and I sorted through individual household and commercial trash at the, at the solid waste facility at the landfill. Um, the material that was coming across our line was sometimes worse. Uh, it was yard waste, it was human waste, it was animal waste, it was dead animals, it was um, diapers, it was trash. It was just a lot of stuff that I could not risk the health and safety of my employees. And so in that email, I specifically said, please let me make it very clear that we are in no way suggesting to end our business partnership or asking you to, excuse me, to no longer bring in material. What I am asking is that we work together to clean up recycling. We cannot reach your individual customers, but you can. I asked him what support he needed, where could we help? We were willing to look for grants to provide this information, grants that would pay for the postage, for the printing of the materials, just to get it out to the customers. Um, I ended the email with just saying success really starts at the cart, and that's what we have been working with on our consumers um, in-house and also our recycling customers that bring in material to the recycling center. I asked for him to get back with me. Um, we played phone tag that day, could not get in touch with each other, and I did not hear anything in return. The very next week, one of my staff come in and said that they received a letter from Clayton and Hurdle, which also had been reached out and I received a copy of it from Heidi um, that was talking about how we were not willing to work with Clayton and Hurdle. We were not willing to give them um, the understanding that they needed and the, the message that they sent out to their employee, to their customers was Clayton and Hurdle looks forward to continuing recycling. However, if our recycling continues to be a problem for the Person County Recycling Center, we will discontinue service at the end of 2021. So what I wanted to make very clear on record today was that at no time have we asked, suggested, or wanted to end our partnership with Clayton and Hurdle because we know that without them, the recycling will really go downhill within, within Person County. We know that this um, that, that recycling is a vital part of our environment and we are extremely blessed and fortunate that Person County offers this option, not only to their residents, but also for Person Industries to run it to provide these jobs to adults with disabilities. Um, our newest campaign, I have provided you with a copy of that as well. It is called Stick With These Six, and it just kind of helps everyone to get, let's get recycling back to basics. And so, so many times our individuals throughout the county were wanting to focus on what was not acceptable or, well, it's not on the list, so that means I can bring it to the recycling center. We want everyone to get back to basics where they're focusing on these six commodities because the six that are listed on your sheet are what can bring us in money, okay? Um, an, an additional information was that buyers for more buyers for our single stream have opened up and where recently we were paying one, we were paying $100 a ton um, to get rid of our single stream and commingled because the recycling industry had had gone so um, had had so much confusion and everything going on. Where we are now sending it to waste management, and we are being paid twenty two dollars and fifty cent a ton. So huge difference in what we were paying, and now we are receiving some money to send out single stream. Also, cardboard prices are up to one hundred and eighty dollars a ton based compared to last year when they had dropped to $70 a ton. So the recycling industry is looking like it is on a upward, upward climb. Of course, that's an industry where uh, things are just a continuous up and down. And so we ride the wave 
when it comes in. But I just wanted to be able to provide you guys with a little update, especially in regards to the feasibility study, what we're doing at Person Industries and the Recycling Center. Do, does anyone have any questions for me? Well, thank you for what you do. <clears throat> Common sense approach uh, to recycling. I don't know how anyone would not want to join in and do their part in this as far as our citizens are recycling. Um, any comments? Mr. Chair, <laughs> I do. I do. I do. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Amanda, for what y'all do out there. Uh, I um, I had a uh, garbage service at one time and we were recycling, but that went away and that was okay. So it's on me and I make sure that uh, uh, I separate my recycle and I take it up there and put it in the proper bins. And I think that's the, one of the most important things for you is that when people do come up there and carry their recycle is how you've got it broken down exactly. here. That's what you should do. And I know sometimes it's not always perfect, but uh, I appreciate it. And I'm all about recycling. I think it's very important for our environment and for our, uh, for the world really. So thank you. Appreciate it. And um, uh, I, hopefully things will work out with, uh, with Clayton and her. I hope so. We're, we're working. I'm trying to keep communication open with them. And just to give you an idea of how long it takes for information to really stick with individuals or residents of the community. We started the no bag policy or asking our individuals not to bag their recyclables in uh, July of 19. And we are just now really within the last probably five, six months are really seeing the effects of that campaign. So it takes a while to retrain um, and get individuals back in back in the ball game of doing things correctly. And a lot of times, avid recyclers want to recycle everything. And we want to do the best that we can. But what everyone has to remember is that for us to recycle it, we have to have an end user and a buyer for that commodity. That, that's a hard education curve. It is. <laughs> for a lot of people. Because I know even in my household, I have to tell my guys, no, you can't put that in there. That's not, I mean, so you said... Mailing this out to all Clayton and Hurdle customers, why not? Why don't we mail this out to the entire county? I mean, if there's a grant for postage to mail this out to educate mm -hmm. our, all of our residents. And so the, the good I news is- I see Gordon rolling his eyes over there. <laughs> no, we- Just uh, a suggestion, Gordon. We have applied for a it's grant a through grants.gov. Uh, we just applied for that to cover us to send that out to each household. Okay. Um, what we do is we participate in the clip and save with the radio station, mm -hmm. and we provide a smaller clip of that, and that goes out to residents of the county. Clayton and Hurdle did receive that, and they did send that out to all their customers. So you didn't? didn't Thank you for that update. So we, we were told that it was sent out. We provided them with a digital copy. We also told them that we would have them printed for them if they needed them. <coughs> It may, may not have just gotten to my mailbox yet, okay. but I hadn't gotten that. Okay. okay. Well, we provided it for them and they said that they were going to update their customers. Any other questions? Thank you so much for the update. Thank Glad you to hear for having news. me and Thanks. thank you for your time. Very, very informative. Thank you for all you Thank you for all you doing. Thank you. Item number eight on the agenda is fiscal year 2022 ISO fire rating reduction bonuses. Ms. Cadney. We are celebrating the achievements of three of our local fire departments who have worked hard and passed inspections that have resulted in reduced ISO ratings within their districts. This results in savings on homeowners insurance for those who are uh, covering their homes in each of these districts. The board previously established a process to reward fire departments for their efforts to reduce their ratings. So to summarize, Allensville has gone from a nine to a five, Hurdle Mills from a nine to a six, and City of Roxborough covers the rural Person County One District, and they reduced their ISO rating in that coverage area from a nine to a four. And so the board, board's process involves awarding additional funding through the fire district tax fund to each of the departments. And the amount designated for this is $7,500 per ISO 
rating reduction. So you can see in the chart in your agenda packet, the bonus that each of these departments will receive that will be added to their annual funding allocation. We do have funds available in this fiscal year in the fire tax district budget in the unallocated line item to sufficiently cover this amount. And um, just as an additional uh, piece of information, CEPO is scheduled to be inspected in December. And so we do have, there will still be funding remaining if they do have their inspection and the, that results in a reduction there will still be funding in the unallocated line item remaining in this fiscal year to approve these bonuses. And there are contract addendums that go along with this. Those were included in your packets. Sorry. They um, mirror the contract addendum that was done for Timberlake when they reduced their uh, rating within the last couple of years. And there is also an amendment to the city of Roxborough contract for the fire services that they are providing in person county one. There is a revised amendment in hard copy for the city of Roxborough at your places this morning with a note as to why there were some edits made that was based on some feedback that we got back from the city and it's just to mirror. I had kind of cut and pasted from the the addendums with the volunteer fire department so that cleaned up language just mirrors the language in the city contract a little bit better. What were the three again, Allensville? Allensville Hurdle. went from a nine to a five, Hurdle Mills a nine to a six, and the City of Roxborough in the Person County One District from a nine to a four. They are all to be commended. That's what the uh, purpose of going about this like we've done, and they have taken the ball and run with it, done a good job, and uh, very commendable. And I, I think we have some others in the county that are in the process of doing the same thing. And uh, the bottom line result is uh, lower insurance for our citizens. And a higher level of services being provided absolutely, by the department. Absolutely. So it's a win-win. Questions from anyone? <laughs> Go for it, Derek. <laughs> Just a little fun, BJ. Thank you very much. Sure. We need a motion to yes, approve that resolution. Mm -hmm. well, it's approve. actually some contract addenda okay, that we're sorry. asking you to approve. You know, make a motion to approve, it, approve the contract addendum. And then also to award the bonuses. And award the bonuses. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Everyone clear on the motion? Yes, sir. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Non motion carried. Thank you. Item number nine, resolution yes. establishing the 2022 schedule of regular meetings. I'm Ms. Yolk. Yes, good afternoon, commissioners. I have two uh, housekeeping items, if you will, uh, for your approval. The first is a resolution that establishes your meeting schedule for 2022. We distribute and post this about this time of year for the upcoming year. So that is before you. Uh, as you're aware, statutes require you to have at least one board meeting a month. We um, have a proposed uh, schedule for you that uh, consistently has two meetings per month with the exception of July and December, which has been consistent with your previous practices. The board also took action to, uh, during the pandemic, hold your meetings here in the auditorium rather than your boardroom. So uh, at an appropriate time that you would like to hold your meetings upstairs, that would require an additional uh, action to return to the boardroom. So we have designated in this schedule to continue meeting in the auditorium unless there is an opportunity where the um, auditorium is booked for elections um, as a polling site, then in that case, it's noted that your, your meeting would be held in the boardroom. We also looked at potential conflicts of uh, conferences that some commissioners attend and there are no conflicts with the proposed meeting schedule. Um, and I also have designated your second meeting in February, your day meeting as your annual board retreat, if that meets um, the commissioner's desire to conduct that that time. So both of those would be taken in one motion, you're saying? 
Yes. So I'd like you to consider the dates to uh, take action to adopt the resolution to establish your regular scheduled Board of County Commissioner meetings for 2022. And in doing so, we'll distribute a copy and post this for the public. Motion, motion to adopt the dates. Motion to adopt. Any discussion? Um, I have a conflict of interest on February the 7th. That's my birth date. <laughs> I worked on mine. I can't tell you how many birthdays I have celebrated with you all. Happy Valentine's. Okay, we'll bring cake. Yeah, yes, Valentine's. we can sing to you. Okay. We do have a motion. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No motion carried. Item number 10, yes. fiscal year 2022-23. Budget calendar, Ms. Shaw. Yes, this is another housekeeping item where we outline the process uh, for the annual budget adoption. Uh, it takes us uh, a lot of steps, and you'll see that some of the dates on this proposed calendar are for internal purposes. Uh, staff uses this as well to uh, keep ourselves organized, but I have a couple of um, dates on there that are, are very important to this board. So I wanted to make you aware of those. Of course, I mentioned the annual retreat being uh, February 22nd for the board that will help set some priorities for your upcoming budget. Um, we have a CIP that'll be presented to the board at your April 4th meeting with an adoption at the second April meeting if the board is ready to do so. The recommended budget then would be presented on uh, May 16th. You're required to hold a budget public hearing. I've got that noted here for your meeting on June 6th. And then your adoption of the annual budget is uh, proposed to be um, conducted at your meeting in June, your second meeting, that would be June 20th. So again, we ask for adoption of the budget calendar so that we can begin our processes and post this uh, for staff and public. Motion to adopt. Motion to adopt the calendar as presented in a discussion. Hearing none, um, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion carried. Thank you. Next on our agenda is um, the chairman's report. I have no further report at this time. Manager York. Commissioners, I promise to keep you informed as the vaccine mandates um, began rolling out with more details. So I will attempt to provide you the latest update uh, as I know it. There are currently three vaccine mandates that have been issued by the federal government. The one that we're focusing a lot on is um, called, uh, OSHA put it out, it's called an emergency temporary standard. It applies to all employers with 100 employees, and that is full-time and part-time, so we certainly fall under that. Um, we have um, heard that it's being appealed at the courts on the constitutionality. So at this point, uh, we're sort of sitting tight. We did have a call, all 100 managers, last week with the Commissioner of Labor, uh, Josh Dobson, to hear kind of what his guidance was and what steps the Department of Labor was taking. And so we're just sort of uh, sitting tight as we're anticipating some legal action at both the state and federal level which will impact us uh, as to what our next steps look like. But the OSHA recommendations were that the vaccines were required for our employees as of January 4th. And it sounds like we're now sort of in a holding pattern as this plays out um, within the court system. I did, Commissioner Palmer, on that call, ask uh, for guidance about elected officials and whether or not they were considered employees. And um, the commissioner said that that had never been asked and he hadn't considered that and he didn't have a good answer for that. So none of us really know at this point in time, we're just sort of um, pushing pause. We're encouraging uh, voluntary vaccinations by our workforce. And uh, at this point do not have a clear direction on how to move forward. Some of the direction we had been given were that 
uh, employees would have an option of vaccination or a weekly testing, but that the testing was not to incur any cost by the employer. So we're just sort of sitting tight uh, as this plays out in the court system right now. So that's the latest update that I can offer. We're keeping a close watch on that and we'll keep our workforce informed as uh, more direction comes through um, the court system. It's a never moving part. Uh, it's been an interesting uh, target. One. Appreciate yeah. your update. You know, may I say something, please, sir? I'm not worried about Charlie Palmer because you know where I stand. All of you do. I'm not taking no vaccination. What I'm worried about is losing workers. For this we county. are worried about that as well. And it better be taken under consideration because yep. you're going to find yourselves about a lot of different workers. Yes. I mean, this, this is constitutional. A mandate is not constitutional. That's my thoughts. That's my knowledge, too. Thank you. That's all I had. Thank you. Commissioner for you. And no report, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Palmer. That's it. Mr. Gentry. I'm good. Thank you. Commissioner Sims. Yes, I have a few things I'd like to say. Um, and it kind of ties in with Woody a little bit when he, some of the things that he mentioned, it makes you think about when we talk about teamwork. Um, you know, we have a group of people that uh, have attacked, harassed the following the boards by emails, phone calls, requesting copies of certain emails from certain departments. And the list goes Piedmont Community College, Economic Development uh, Commission, Courier Times, Chamber of Commerce, County Manager, the County Commissioners, the Board of Education, Social Service, Health Department. You know, my question is who is left? Who, who are they going to go after next? And what is their end game? This is not good for the county. It's not good for economic development. This is not going to create teamwork. It is only going to cause separation. And it just needs to stop. On a good note, positive note, uh, last Tuesday, I had the privilege to present Captain Ricky Hughes uh, with the Roxborough Police Department with the Elks National Drug Awareness Award. It's called the Enrique Camarino Award. This award is given usually to a law enforcement officer who has gone above and beyond in supporting drug awareness in the city or in county. This award has only been awarded in North Carolina two times. And it's a very special award. And I certainly want to thank Ricky. I think we all should if we see Ricky Hughes and thank him for the service he has done for this city and county. And I also want to thank all the law enforcement officers in the city and county, Highway Patrol, for putting their lives on the line every day. And I also would like to end with congratulations and thank you to the fire departments who have lowered their ISO ratings and hope they continue on. And that's it, thank you. Thank you uh, very much. Thank you everyone for being here today. Do we have anyone that has enough courage to make a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved. <laughs> All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, none. Motion carried. We are.